of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, in accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast over Lunenburg Public Access. I'll take roll call. We're all present and accounted for. Um, is there any public comment from the board? Is there any public comment from the public not regarding any of our agenda items? Please. This thing on? Yeah. Could you just please state your name and address for the record, please? My name is John Baker. I reside at 53 Chase Road in Lunenburg. And my purpose here tonight is to speak against any kind of commerce of uh, marijuana in this town, and I'm going to give you some reasons why. I spent many years on the police force in the town here. Um, I retired uh, in 1985 due to injury. Drunk driver hit me. Um, I was later arrested and found weed in the car besides the drinking. Okay. I subsequently went on the uh, state as a bail commissioner for 28 years. And in those 28 years, I've seen a lot of things. And I believe that in some, some instances, this, this marijuana is a gateway drug. A lot of people disagree with that. But I'm going to point to one story back uh, several years ago. Uh, I was at uh, Fitchburg PD on a bail hearing. Incidentally, a bail, bail, bail commissioner takes the place of a judge after 4 o'clock weekends. And we hold bail, bail hearings, release people, whatever. OK, well, uh, back a few years ago, um, I was uh, at a hearing and uh, came in. The young lady was up for, re for bail and so forth. I recognized her. This was the second time I had, uh, this was going to be the third time I had business with her. And uh, she started out with the, the marijuana thing and subsequently later on graduated to the, you know, higher drug, <coughs> drug stuff you know, cocaine, whatever, and so forth. And at the time, the OIC went back to his office. He took out a, a book, and he came back in. And it was the most compassionate thing I've ever heard. He, he was showing a uh, case log of people in her particular instance, OK? And OK, this girl, she's dead. This girl, she's dead. This girl, she's dead. And he went on and on and on about the thing. And uh, it was the most inspiring thing I ever heard an OIC or somebody like that try to help this person that was obviously got a problem with drugs, OK? And she did start out with the, you know, the, the smoking weed and all that stuff. OK, so it went on and on and on. And she'd always made her court appearances and so forth, so there's no legitimate reason to deny her bail. At the time, the bail was $40, okay? So she, she came up with the 40 bucks. Subsequently, I says, listen, I'm gonna give you, here's your 40 bucks back, okay? This is what I want you to do the next morning. Go out, have a good, healthy breakfast. Keep the other 20 bucks and remember this incident, okay? I'm down at Sears Town some years later, okay? This girl recognized me, I guess, I don't know. Asked me, uh, you're the bail commissioner, right? Yeah, you know, I kind of, you know, I've hundreds of people I deal with, so. And she says, you know what, I'm clean. She says, I still have the $20. Thank you. Is there any other public comment from the public? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bill Gustis. I live at 19 Burke Street in Lunenburg. Um, I know you're going to be discussing the case later on this, this evening. I am not here to discuss the case. I'm first here just to congratulate you on your reorganization and congratulate Mr. Uh, Cole on your election. Uh, I know that uh, there's a plan that you will be discussing later 
I think it represents our best and last effort to, to try to work things out. It, uh, you know, it, it addresses as many, uh, you know, many of the concerns or all the concerns that everybody has had. Um, I just wanted to, you know, ask that you look at it with fresh eyes and um, take a, a good long look at it and, 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 and go from there. I'm not going to advocate one way or another. Just asking you to give us a, a, a fair shot. Uh, I am the managing partner of 994 Northfield Road LLC, who is the landlord of the uh, <coughs> the company that is looking to do the development, and uh, we are people too. We live in town. We've been here for my wife's been here her whole life. I've invested a lot of time in this community myself, serving as the first CAFO for three years, serving on the sewer commission for many years, and uh, we too are residents in town, and uh, I hope you can see this as something that is the best for everybody, not just us, uh, but also the community, the town in particular, and the best we can do for the abutters as well. Thank you very much, and good luck in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go on. Uh, any more public comment from the public? All right. We'll go into our first agenda item, which is an A and R plan for 92 Cove Road. Good evening. My name is Steve Ballard from Whitman and Bingham. I represent Ray Rice, who's the applicant on the a and plan they have. Uh, the owner isn't a butter to Ray Rice. He's going to subdivide off a piece to convey to Ray Rice, who is 82 Cove Road. Um, Mark Flag owns 92 Flag Road, uh, Cove Road. Okay. On buildable parcel. Just for conveyance. So you're taking, so you're taking parcel A and adding it to lot two A, or adding it to lot to 82 Cove. The land of Ray Rice. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Follow that. Mm -mm. This piece here is going to here. What's the reasoning behind it? The so area that's in that, it, piece that is land going here. Yep. is close to his house, and it's going to give him just a little more yard. Okay. Are they related? Not oh. that I know of. I think he originally uh, sold the land to Ray Rice. Okay. Did they need a Title V, or was that in the packet? No, no they, I mean, it all went through. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we have the comments the Board of Health signed off. Oh, they did. All right, I see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't change, it doesn't materially change either parcel. <clears throat> well, it's oh, an wait, does it? The no. frontage, or does the frontage here? Yeah, it's non-conforming, but it's existing. Does it make it any more, less conforming? No. The hammerhead, the lot area? It was signed off by the building inspector. If I'm not mistaken, this is a, an RA zone, so he only needs 80,000 square feet of upland. <coughs> yeah, so it's no less. So where he's not giving him frontage, even if his frontage is non-conforming, he's still required to keep the two, double lot size, but he has that plus some. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it's still... This is residence A, you said, right? Correct. Yeah, so he's still covered. I move that we accept the A&R as documented. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
dead back, please. Yes. 25? Yes. 625. Today's the 25th. All day. Till midnight. Mm -hmm. Then it changes. I'm not sure what to. Changes. Sure. See you. See you. Yeah. <laughs> Are you leaving? Yep. No. We got this. Well, I'll ask. Do you guys want to move down there since we can have like a normal discussion? I can. See I have my here. feet up and I'm quite comfortable. I can see from here. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, you're good to go. Uh, we're going to go into our recreational marijuana bylaw. Adam's going to give a presentation, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions from anybody. Um, our town council is present and our chief of police, so I'm sure they'll be able to give some input too. So thank you. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, I thought there would be a few more people here than that since this is the, the buzz all around the state. What we're going to do is, is this slideshow isn't for or against uh, anything. It's, this is what the process is that the state has laid out, what we're up against, what we can regulate, what we can't regulate, how we regulate, and how they regulate. Um, as we discuss Question four has been decided. It's law within the state, so uh, it's not necessarily going to help us to say, no, marijuana shouldn't be legal anywhere. Maybe we shouldn't sell it here. Maybe we shouldn't grow it here. Those are valid choices that we can talk about how we might do it. Uh, I might run through this kind of quickly. There are some uh, paper copies if anybody wants to follow along. Uh, we'll post this to the town website for all you folks watching at home or watching tomorrow night at midnight when you catch us on replay. Um, I'm also going to run through a, a couple of quick slides that have to do with the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, it was actually generated by one of the commissioners. I, I don't want to talk too much about that, but I just sort of want to put out there some of the things that they've put out to uh, identify how and what they're regulating internally as far as the operation of some of these businesses, uh, because it might assist in uh, guiding our conversation if we do want to talk about regulating rather than prohibiting. So as we all know, November 8th, 2006, um, the state of Massachusetts and the same ratio as the town of Lunenburg voted 53 to 47 to uh, approve the legalization of the adult use of marijuana for non-medical purposes. Uh, in July of the following year, uh, the general court approved some modifications uh, to that law which uh, result in, in the regulations and, and whatnot that we're dealing with now. Personal use. Anyone over the age of 21 years can consume, carry, grow, purchase marijuana upon the issuance of a license to such group. This isn't something that the town can regulate or increase. Uh, we can and do currently regulate the public consumption of marijuana. It is not allowed. Uh, you may consume in your home uh, or other private locations, uh, but not in a, in a public venue. Home growth, you can grow up to 10 ounces of marijuana, all by your lonesome at your house, from a maximum of six plants if there's one adult, 12 plants if there is more than one adult. Um, I don't have any idea how much marijuana one plant grows, but uh, it sounds like 12 plants would produce quite a bit of marijuana. Uh, so. Uh, that gets to our next point. Uh, you can give all the marijuana you want away to other people who are 21 years of age or older. Um, we don't have, as I understand it, the ability to regulate this. Um, it can't be for the exchange of 
funds. Uh, I would also believe that the exchange of goods and or services for marijuana would be considered remunera remuneration uh, and you would not be uh, able to do that either. You can't put an ad on Facebook, hey, I've got a lot of pot, come pick it up. Um, and it has to be to people who are over the age of 21. Mr. Bernie? Uh, yes. It's only one, up to one ounce, not all that you want. <laughs> Correct. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you can possess marijuana in public um, as long as you're not smoking it in the town of Lunenburg. Uh, and we cannot regulate the sale of marijuana accessories. Uh, those are protected as retail goods uh, under the current law. These are the types of licensed non-medical adult use facilities. Marijuana retailers, marijuana product manufacturers, uh, and that is not accessories like pipes or rolling papers or things like that. That is products that contain marijuana, uh, whether they are oils, tinctures, um, infused beverages, uh, edible marijuana products, that's the type of manufacturing they're speaking of. Uh, cult of. Marijuana cultivator, obviously that's somebody who grows it. Independent testing laboratory, and any other type of licensed marijuana related business, uh, which they have a few examples of. Uh, this does not include medical marijuana treatment centers or registered marijuana dispensaries as they are currently known. Uh, the additional types of licenses they've sort of talked about are craft marijuana cultivators, uh, micro business, which is really just taking all of this and making it smaller, uh, third party transporter, and an existing licensee transporter. Uh, so we'll look at what each of these really means to the town of Lunenburg and uh, what it might do. Uh, so a retailer is someone who's authorized to buy and or sell marijuana. Um, they are the end user, uh, the person who sells to the end user, to the consumer. They are the front line of marijuana retail. Um, they may also be cultivating, but their license allows them to purchase from cultivators, manufacturers, uh, and to retail it to consumers. Uh, to my knowledge, they are the only um, establishment that has the ability to sell products to consumers. Uh, and they may be located with a medical marijuana treatment center. And I think what uh, statewide we'll probably see uh, in the first rush of retail is a lot of them being uh, medical marijuana treatment centers that are also getting a recreational license and <coughs> co-located separate spaces um, due to the way that they're licensing. A marijuana product manufacturer can obtain, manufacture, process, and package marijuana and or marijuana products. Uh, so again, they're making your oils, your tinctures, your vaping liquids, your marijuana edibles, uh, marijuana wax products, whatever else uh, someone might produce containing marijuana that isn't just the raw plant. Uh, and they can sell to retailers, but not to consumers. Uh, cultivator is somebody who can cultivate. Uh, and in this case, I believe that the processing would only be what would one would consider an agricultural type of processing, uh, removing the plant from the ground, preparing the plant for transport and or sale or consumption. Uh, but not actually taking it and creating secondary goods from the plant itself. Uh, and this, this license is only allowed to sell to retailers and processors, not to consumers. Uh, Craft Marijuana Cooperative is a type of cultivator, uh, but as we'll see in a minute, it, it has some, some other opportunities. Uh, marijuana cultivators come in 11 different sizes from one to 5,000 square feet, uh, all the way up to 90 to 100,000 square feet. Uh, and the, the tiers are just for licensing cost. Uh, you cannot be a marijuana cultivator and have more than three facilities, and you cannot grow more than a cumulative canopy of 100,000 square feet. Uh, and so when we say cumulative canopy, that is the 
square foot area of the plants that you are growing cannot exceed 100,000 square feet. So you could have a million square feet of building, but if only 100,000 square feet of it is covered with plant canopy, you are compliant in, in some sense. Uh, and they have uh, caps that they have to meet as far as production and consumption. So the commission can reduce the tier license of a grower uh, if they're not selling 70% or more of the product they're producing. Uh, and a, on, the, on the flip side, a cultivator can go and request an increase in their license size if they're selling 85% or more of the product that they've uh, grown uh, in the, the previous six months. So really this is, this is probably the scariest kind of use because you don't really know what it is. It's going on in a building, uh, what happens with it, uh, and it's the largest use for the most, uh, in probably most instances. Uh, so there are some controls from the commission itself on, on managing it, the sizes uh, to make sure that people aren't just growing a bunch of stuff that they're hoarding or, or keeping aside. Uh, a craft marijuana co cultivator co cooperative, if I can say the word, uh, is organized in Massachusetts in one of the variety of corporate ways of Massachusetts residents. They can cultivate, manufacture, process, package, and brand marijuana and or marijuana products. So as a craft cultivator, uh, they have a little bit more latitude. They're sort of a manufacturer and a cultivator rolled into one. Uh, and they may transport or sell to other marijuana establishments, but not to consumers. So again, they're, they're tied up in that um, production stream space, not in the consumer space. Uh, and only one uh, craft license can be issued per business entity. So you can't create a business entity of, you know, 100 Massachusetts residents and try and set up craft cultivator cooperatives all over the state. It's a, it's a single license that you're doing. Um, they are, however, allowed to cultivate up to 100,000 square feet of canopy. Uh, my understanding is that they fall under the same regulations as other cultivators. So they can't take up and uh, start growing 100,000 square feet and sell 10% of it and say, oh, we're just going to store the rest of this for later. Uh, they need to meet the, the production and sales uh, thresholds that are, that are for any other cultivator. Uh, marijuana research facility. Um, these are academic facilities where they are allowed to cultivate and perform testing and other research, uh, but they are not allowed to sell to other marijuana establishments or to consumers. Uh, they are there merely to do academic sorts of work on or with marijuana. Uh, so this would be analogous to you know, a college extension or a research facility uh, developing drugs or uh, treatments or studying the impacts of uh, marijuana. So there's two other, there's the independent testing laboratory and the standards testing laboratory. These are third party laboratories that are intended. The independent testing laboratory is an industry laboratory that is monitoring the goods that are produced by the industry for uh, molds and bacterias and insecticides and those kind of things to make sure they're safe for public consumption, safe for uh, non-medical use uh, and they need to be <clears throat> independent of any other marijuana establishment so their funding doesn't come from being tied into a treatment facility or another marijuana establishment or, or licensee and they are uh, licensed and, and inspected and all of those fun things by the Cannabis Control Commission. Now the standards testing laboratory is exactly the same as an independent testing laboratory, but they work at the behest of the Cannabis Control Commission uh, to verify uh, the independent testing laboratory uh, and ensure that there isn't uh, nefarious things happening or uh, inadequate testing or inaccurate testing. 
And then we get to the, the marijuana transporter. Uh, this is uh, anybody who takes marijuana from, from one licensee to another, uh, and there's two categories. There's a third port party transporter, uh, which would be like, let's say Brinks decided they wanted to get into the marijuana transporting uh, game or Wells Fargo or one of those. They don't have any other marijuana license, whether it's an RMD, uh, registered marijuana dispensary, or any of the non-medical licenses. And these folks would be responsible just for the transportation of marijuana from one establishment to the other. Uh, they are, uh, they're vetted, tested, uh, and, and licensed through the Cannabis Control Commission. Or you can be an existing, li existing licensee transporter, which would be someone who has another marijuana establishment, whether it's cultivation, processing, retail, uh, and they want to lease or sell their services out to other marijuana establishments who don't want to invest in uh, the requirements of transport. Uh, so they would be, be licensed under that. So now we get to the part that we all really care about is, is what's the municipal role in licensing? Uh, what can we do uh, and, and how does it work? So everybody's aware of how uh, alcohol licenses are issued. Um, someone applies to the Board of Selectmen, they come in front of them, they present their paperwork, all of the, the background, their Cory checks, all of that. The Board of Selectmen vets them, has a hearing, does the discussion, uh, blesses or doesn't and passes on to the ABCC who gives a final approval. Uh, so with marijuana licensing, it's going to be sort of the opposite. Uh, the power is going to start with the state and the Cannabis Control Commission will take all the licensing in, they'll do all the vetting, they'll be the ones issuing the license. Uh, and the community will be part of that in some ways. Uh, the first is that the potential marijuana establishment needs to conduct a community outreach. Oh, this should say meeting. Uh, I missed one of them. Uh, with the community. And they will come out to the community uh, within six months of when they plan to apply. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at what that looks like in a, in a minute. Uh, they're required to enter into a host community agreement with the community. You can't uh, stave off of that. That's included in the law. And then the community needs to certify that uh, the potential marijuana establishment is in compliance with the local bylaws and any requirements for buffering. Community impact meeting is outlined in 935 CMR 500, which is the Cannabis Control Commission's regulations uh, for marijuana establishments. Uh, so you'll notice that this mirrors a lot of the requirements that uh, the Board of Selectmen might have for some public hearings. Uh, this is not a public hearing, it's a meeting. It is put on by the potential applicant. Uh, it is not, uh, it involves, but it's not in any way uh, run or metered by the local municipal government. Uh, so seven days prior to the meeting, uh, the, that would be calendar days, there needs to be an advertisement in the local newspaper. Uh, a copy of the, the meeting notice needs to be filed with the town clerk, the planning board, the contracting authority for the municipality, and the local licensing authority for adult use marijuana, if there are, is any. Uh, and a copy of the meeting notice must be sent to all of others. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's a 300 foot radius, similar to uh, what you would see with planning board, zoning board, public hearings. Um, the content of the meeting uh, is discussions of the types of marijuana establishments being proposed uh, with the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, I guess the best way to describe it is an a la carte menu. You can come in and you can apply for a single establishment or you can apply for a number of establishments uh, at the same time. You can be just a retailer, you can be just a cultivator, you can be a retailer and a cultivator, you can be a manufacturer and a cultivator. So they would be responsible for informing uh, the public that comes to that meeting, what licenses they're applying for, what establishments they intend to open. Uh, discussing their security information, uh, I don't think that this would be 
the detailed security plan that they may uh, submit to the police, but it would be more, here's how we're going to handle security, here's what the intent is, here's what our, our diversion programs are. Uh, they would be responsible for talking about how they're going to prevent marijuana from being given to minors uh, or anybody under the age of 21, uh, what, how they plan to impact the community in a positive manner, uh, whether it's uh, you know, drug diversion programs, whether it's um, just giving the money, of the town a boatload of money, whether it's um, you know, sponsoring local Little League, how, what their, their intent is for uh, being a, a good community member, and then how they're going to not be a nuisance. What's their plan for managing the site in a way that is reasonably in tune with what the town would like? Uh, and uh, embedded in the law is a requirement that there be a question and answer with the public that's there, uh, with the members of the marijuana uh, establishment. Uh, so they can't come in, you know, give the dog and pony show and say, all right, we're done, pack it up and leave before anybody gets to ask any questions or, or put their input out there or any of that kind of stuff. So uh, it, it, it's... It's required, and this is required prior to them submitting anything to the Cannabis Control Commission. So, uh, no one will find out, you know, after the hearing that they issued the license that there potentially could be a marijuana establishment in town. Uh, well, at least that's the intent. Host community agreements. I think that we've uh, seen some of these with the solar. Um, we often re refer to them as, as pilot agreements with the solar. So. Uh, folks who are doing non-medical adult use marijuana will be paying taxes. They're not 501c3s for the most part. Uh, so this would be in addition to uh, any taxes they pay. Uh, it, the act now requires that both medical and non-medical um, adult use marijuana establishments uh, sign a host community agreement that allows for a community impact fee. This is... Uh, this is, a new, this is new territory for Massachusetts because generally in Massachusetts you hear community impact fee and everyone goes, oh, you can't do that. Uh, but this specifically uh, per permits it. Uh, the costs need to be reasonably related to the location of the marijuana establishment. Uh, there's a cap of 3% of the gross receipts of the potential marijuana establishment and the host community agreement is for five years. Uh, now, my understanding is that after five years, you are then, as a municipality, required to document and justify the costs that you have incurred and that the 3% is a reasonable payback of those costs. Uh, so if you know, if the 3% is $3 million and, and you can only document costs of $750,000, um, you're probably going to have an establishment that pushes back on, on where, where that number is. Um, one would expect that, you know, if an establishment were to come at the, the forefront of, of licensing, they're going to sign whatever agreement you want because they want to be first through the door. But... Uh, you know, we would have to look at, at how we document it and what those costs are. Uh, and prior to the Cannabis Control Commission moving forward on any application, they need a certification that uh, the host community agreement has been entered into. Zoning bylaw compliance. This is um, probably the, the hardest to nail down. Uh, they need to, they being the applicant, needs to document to the Cannabis Control Commission that the proposed site is compliant with the local bylaw. Uh, that once the application is filed uh, and deemed complete, at that point the Cannabis Control Commission notifies the municipality uh, formally and says, hey, we have a, a license for a license request for a marijuana establishment in your community. Um, this is what it is. This is where it is. Uh, does this meet your local bylaws? Uh, and the community is required to answer that within 60 days. If they do not answer, it's deemed compliant and the license may be issued. Uh, compliance is not judged on holding an actual permit. Uh, so many communities that have already uh, licensed or 
uh, zoned marijuana have done so in uh, a special permit process. So this certification isn't saying, you know, uh, Bob's Marijuana Store has a special permit to operate at one Main Street. It says that, okay, he wants to operate at one Main Street. Our zoning says that he can apply for a special permit there. Uh, so he would be in compliance with the ability to apply for the special permit. Uh, one would infer that once he's either grant, probably granted a provisional license, he would apply for the special permit, the hearing would be conducted, and if issued, he would go forth or they would go forth and um, go back to the commission and they would say, all right, you have your special permit, you've met all the other requirements, uh, here's your full license, go ahead and open. Uh, this is super easy to read on the screen. Um, the zoning bylaw uh, accounts for time, place, and manner. Uh, time, place, and manner can be done through special permits, can be done through site plan approval. Uh, theoretically, if the town wished to, they could create an overlay district and say, here's our marijuana overlay district, and this is the only place that you can do it, and this is what you have to do to be able to do that. Uh, and it needs to reasonably safeguard the community. Uh, the law specifically says, and I, I have to imagine it was written intentionally this way, that it may not unreasonably or impracticably uh, well, it actually says the measures necessary to comply may not be sub may not subject licensees to unreasonable risk or require such a high investment of risk, money, time, and or other resources or asset that a reasonably prudent business person would not operate a marijuana establishment. Uh, I think town council's here, and I don't know if he could parse out what that means. Uh, so really, that's a bunch of lawyer gobbledygook to say you have to kind of play nice if you're going to do it, or we reserve the right to apply uh, or to appeal your decision and say you didn't meet this clause. Uh, one would generally think that if you are putting hard requirements in writing, uh, that takes out the unreasonably uh, unreasonable risk because people are well aware of what it is. Uh, but I've been proven wrong about that stuff before. Uh, so it's, it's trying to be reasonable, and, and what's reasonable, I guess, is a spectrum that everybody sees differently. If, for whatever reason, uh, we are unable or unwilling to create zoning that permits, regulates, prohibits uh, marijuana, uh, adult use, non-medical marijuana, uh, it doesn't just become prohibited, like if we say you can't, um, you can't have a certain type of business here in town, uh, there's a clause in zoning that says if you don't uh, zone for this business, it's automatically prohibited. Uh, marijuana doesn't fall under that clause. Uh, the only other thing that I'm aware of that doesn't fall under that clause is adult uses. Uh, and this fight was fought probably about 20 years ago. Uh, when people wanted to start opening more adult uses and town said, oh, nope, they're, they're not allowed because we don't have a zoning for them. Uh, and eventually the state said, well, tough luck, now you have to zone for them. And if you don't, they're just allowed as you know, a bar or a retail store or whatever. Uh, and marijuana is going to become the same way. So if we just think we can bury our heads in the sand and, and not do it and say, oh, we don't have anything in there, so it's prohibited, <coughs> we're going to be in for a rude awakening or maybe just a sleepy, slow-moving, hungry awakening. Uh, <clears throat> local licensing. The Cannabis Control Commission has said that the town can create its own licensing authority, um, can vest the powers of licensing in some board, commission, etc., as long as it doesn't conflict with state law. Um, I, I, and I think that that's a, that's a tough nut to crack for somewhere like Lunenburg, where this is going to be something we see, hopefully, if it's, if it's zoned, that we're reasonable about it and limit it to a way that, that would be uh, fit into the fabric of the town. We're not going to have a lot of licenses, and uh, it might be more trouble than it's worth to do a licensing committee. Um, maybe, maybe it would be. I don't know. <coughs> Agricultural use exemption. Marijuana 
for about 10 minutes was an agricultural product and could legally be grown under the 40A Section 3 exemption. Uh, and the legislature in uh, the acts of 2016 said, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want marijuana to be considered an agricultural product. Uh, so if you want to cultivate it, you need to specifically meet the uh, zoning that gets put in place and you need to meet the licensing that the state puts forward. Uh, so unless you're an individual cultivating outdoors out of view of the public eye, uh, you shouldn't see too much marijuana growing outside unless there's a big discussion about someone deciding to do that. Um, and you know, it, it, the act also says, again, to follow up on that, that towns can specifically zone the cultivation of marijuana legally under zoning, uh, and it doesn't violate the, uh, the exclusion. Uh, zoning bylaws can restrict licensed cultivation and processing and manufacturing that is a public nuisance. Again, one man's public nuisance is another man's commerce. So uh, that's kind of how do, how do we determine that and it's a matter of uh, uh, defining public nuisance or defining how one of these establishments would, could, or does cause a public nuisance. Uh, it doesn't I mean, we can't do it. It's just being strategic and, and intelligent about the way we do. Uh, we, can, we can restrict their signs like we can anybody else. Uh, generally, you can't restrict content of signs, but you can restrict size, number, coverage, setbacks from the road. Uh, and this specifically uh, makes marijuana establishments analogous to uh, off-premise alcohol licenses. Uh, so that would be your package stores. Uh, beer and wine sellers, uh, and any restrictions that we put on them, we would legally be able to put on marijuana establishments for what they could do. Uh, we can establish civil penalties, which, you know, again, zoning bylaw, that's pretty meat and potatoes. Uh, and we can establish a buffer zone. Uh, there's a buffer zone included in the law, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, but we cannot bar the transport of marijuana through the town of Lunenburg. You can't say, oh, we have a marijuana exclusion, you have to drive around. Uh, because in general, the thought would be that you know, they're secure and not going to bother us. Uh, and any, any bylaw that we adopt would be the same as any other uh, zoning bylaw. Um, all of the fun discussions that we have here at the planning board, uh, ultimately with a proposal for town meeting warrant, um, public hearing here at the planning board, and then uh, being last on the, the town meeting warrant and trying to rush through it so everyone can get out and enjoy their first Saturday in May. Uh, buffer zone requirements. This is, I, I think, what a lot of people are going to be interested in who, who hope to regulate it but want to uh, protect children and puppies and apple pie. Uh, so the current law says that you cannot put a marijuana establishment within 500 feet of an existing public or private school providing education, kindergarten, or any of the grades one through 12. So pre-K, daycare, karate, dance, any of those, those are fine. You can put marijuana establishments right next to them, but not K through 12. Uh, so this, uh, we can, municipalities can adopt a, a bylaw that reduces or increases the distance. Uh, and the bylaw could also increase the list of potential uh, establishments included in triggering that 500 or more or less feet buffer. Uh, the medical marijuana law, uh, I think the language is, oh, it's right here. Absent local siting requirements, uh, marijuana Medical marijuana treatment centers shall not be cited within a radius of 500 feet of a school, daycare, center, or any facility on which children commonly congregate. Um, which is, you know, kind of fuzzy language, but you could generally make an argument for parks, um, ice cream stands, uh, different stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's hard to be wholly inclusive, but it's also hard to you know, work on language that's so uh, fuzzy. 
Limitation or prohibition? Uh, again, I think that there's probably a, a fair amount of people who are also interested in this. Uh, so the general laws, chapter 94, G, section three, allows that communities can prohibit one or more types of marijuana establishments. Uh, they can limit the number of marijuana retailers to fewer than 20% of the number of retail off-premise alcohol licenses issued. Uh, I believe they can limit it to any percentage of those licenses, but fewer than 20% has a different standard, uh, so we'll focus on that. Or we can limit it to uh, fewer than the number of medical marijuana treatment centers, which here in Lunenburg is zero. Uh, so if, not if, we did, the town of Lunenburg voted in favor, 53 to 47 or thereabouts, uh, of question four. So, if we wish to limit to below 20% of our off-premise alcohol licenses, which is eight, uh, or prohibit any or all, um, the limitation only applies to retail. I'm sorry, I didn't think I skipped right over that. Uh, or uh, prohibit any or all types of marijuana establishments, we are required to meet a two-tier process. Uh, first, the voters have to, well, first, one of the steps is the voters have to approve by ballot at an annual or special election uh, the prohibition and the full text of the bylaw. And the bylaw must be approved by the local legislative body here in Lunenburg being town meeting. Uh, so this is, sounds like, oh, honky dory, this is great, uh, but we run into a chicken and an egg situation here uh, because. Our elections and our town meetings are like, they're like right up against each other. You know, it's like, you know, gravy and mashed potatoes. There's, there's not a lot of space between them. So what you do is you have to put the full text of the bylaw on the ballot. And that's great. If you, you write a bylaw and you're like, yeah, yeah, this is great. Um, so, okay, you go to the ballot and you, you pass it at the ballot. And I mean, we've all been to town meeting and Everyone loves to get up and, and change this word or that colon or this sentence of a bylaw on the floor. And once you do that, that ballot vote now becomes invalid and you've got to go get another ballot vote. So you can do this. You can ban it. You can limit it. You can uh, do all sorts of good stuff, but you have to make sure that you can get all your ducks in a row. Uh, so... And, you know, the, the text of the, the bylaw has to be printed in no less than 35 days prior to the election, which is, uh, I believe, state law, uh, state election law, um, not specific to marijuana. It's to, to all ballot questions. Um, and in January of this year, the, the attorney general came down with a decision in Milford that said you have to have this, the text has to be exactly the same in both. Uh, so it... it doesn't mean it's impossible. doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that if there's a, a drive to prohibit, it, it needs to be uh, well orchestrated and, and well thought out. Uh, so that's what I've got for, uh, for pot. What I want to do is actually run through. Um, this is somebody else's PowerPoint. And you'll see the, the wonderful. Uh, you'll only see two C's because um, apparently the Cape Cod Commission was really annoyed that the Cannabis Control Commission chose three C's, and uh, they've been around since the 50s, so the Cannabis Control Commission was nice enough to, to acquiesce and, and just put two C's on there. Uh, so what I, I kind of wanted to do was look at some of the things that uh, this commissioner had put forward uh, about how they regulate certain things, because I think knowing... Uh, the specificity that they put in uh, would, if the discussion or the desire is to talk about regulation rather than prohibition, uh, may steer the conversation in a way that's uh, potentially more useful to developing regulations than uh, getting into some of the, uh, the minutia that uh, we don't really have control over anyway. Uh, so, marijuana products must be handled in compliance with sanitary requirements. Edible marijuana cons uh, products aren't considered food, um, they're considered consumable drugs. 
uh, and they, they have to meet the sanitary requirement of wholesale manufacturing, retail sale, and transportation of food. Um, they must be tested in compliance with protocols of the Department of Public Health. Uh, they, all marijuana and marijuana products must be tracked seed to sale in an interoperable database. Uh, this is similar to what they've done with medical marijuana. Uh, I know that that's been a little bit longer of a slog and hasn't maybe been as successful as uh, a lot of people uh, both in government and in the industry had hoped when they passed it almost six years ago. But um, you know the, the seed to sale thing has, has really stuck around. Uh, they need to post bonds uh, for the destruction of uh, marijuana or marijuana products in, in the event that that's necessary. Uh, they need to comply with laws on cultivation and waste disposal. Uh, and you know, they have energy and, and uh, energy requirements. Cultivators. Um, marijuana product manufacturers, independent laboratories, they have to restrict access only to authorized employees and visitors. Um, who's authorized, I guess, is, is a, an open question, but uh, where the employees are authorized, uh, there's a, a significant vetting process, and if somebody wants this, I can, I can send them the slideshow. I, it's, it's from a public realm, so it's not any sort of proprietary information, uh, but there's a, a, a pretty stringent uh, background check that goes on for people to get uh, employee licenses to work in these facilities. They have to tra track their inventory, uh, there's alarms, they have to log their visitors, uh, and I will tell you I've visited a medical marijuana facility and you know they take your license, they take a photocopy of it, they log when you came in, when you left, uh, and they don't leave you alone without uh, more than one employee within the facility. Uh, so I, I, you know, imagine these are going to be fairly similar if, if and when they, they get up and running. Uh, all the marijuana and products must be stored in limited access areas, 24-hour uh, video surveillance. Uh, I know uh, a lot of medical facilities are required to have redundant independent video surveillance, uh, so they would have two independent systems that operate independently uh, in the event that one were compromised, uh, sufficiently lit, to allow readable images uh, and security plan with the local law enforcement. Uh, this mirrors a lot of the medical uh, stuff. Access to retailer. Um, so it's kind of like going to a bar. They need to have uh, a doorman, for lack of a better term, who's checking government IDs, ensuring people are over the age of 21, uh, and not allowing access to any of the marijuana or marijuana products unless they can prove that. Um, Co-located facilities uh, require that they have separate facilities. Um, the recreation or the non-medical side needs to have its its ability to access, and the medical has its. Um, they this is and I think this is a big one. Um, this was the one that uh, the amount of stuff that they talked about with this and and seeing pictures from from Colorado and California. Uh, I think that the Cannabis Control Commission has taken uh, a lesson from some of the things that happened out uh, in the western part of the country. Uh, they can have a logo, uh, but the logo can't use medical symbols, can't have images of marijuana, buds, leaves, etc. Uh, they can't have related paraphernalia, colloquial references, uh, and they're all prohibited within the logo. So you can come up with whatever you want for Bob's Pot Shop, but it can't have pictures of pot or joints or bongs or pipes or, uh, you know, probably even be called Bob's Pot Shop for that fact. Uh, they can sponsor uh, charitable sporting or similar events, but the marketing is limited uh, to places where 85% or more, so you couldn't have them sponsoring a little league team. Uh, I think I mentioned that earlier in error. Um, all the display, display cases have to be locked. Um, you know, please consume responsibly, sort of like the please drink responsibly. Uh, that works so well most of the time. Uh, at least two other warnings from the menu of choices. Uh, all marketing must include a warning developed by DPH. Uh, so they're looking to control this. Um, these are some graphics that they're looking to require to be uh, added to uh, edible 
items uh, as to inform people or prevent kids from eating them. I mean, I guess if it's a chocolate bar, I don't know how you do that. Um, but uh, at, when I saw the slideshow at, at the, the discussion, uh, they've also prohibited the use of parity wrappers. Uh, so you can't have uh, a marijuana-infused chocolate bar that looks like a Hershey's bar or gummy bears that you know mirror the gummy bears you see at the store uh, to prevent that sort of mix-up of you know mom having her pot M&Ms in her purse and the kid being like oh M&Ms and everybody freaking out uh, never mind whatever long-term damage that might be um, you can't you know and again you, you, they're they're looking at no mascots cartoons brand sponsors celebrity endorsements uh, statements designs you can't give away swag you can't advertise on the TV or radio uh, so there the, there's a whole litany of things um, that they've added to uh, be sure that they're learning from the experiences of, of other states who've taken this stuff on uh, and have been um, whether they like it or not uh, sort of inundated with some of these things that uh, uh, maybe have changed uh, the way that that children interact or uh, look at marijuana and uh, how marijuana might be marketed to uh, everybody in general and mm -hmm. and what the the cachet of it is so i don't know if i have anything else i guess i'll take questions from uh, from the dearth of, well, of individuals here attending <laughs> thank you for that um, yeah, I'd like to hear from the residents. This is sold as a listening session, so I'd like to hear from the residents first. Um, our chief of police is here and town council, so I'd invite them to participate if you have any questions for them. Thank you for coming, by the way. So. <laughs> so do we have any comments or questions from the public? Hi. Hello. Kim Cole, Mass Ave, Moonberg. Um, I have some questions about the community host agreements. So it seems like that's a pretty instrumental part of this process, and it's required by the Cannabis Control Commission. So somebody would come here and present, um, and then there would be I, there's, there's like the listening session. Well, what do you call it? The meeting. The, the community. There's the community meeting, which is, hey, we want to, we want to open a, a marijuana retail establishment. Let's make it easy and just have it be one license. And they talk about what the marijuana license is, what the retail is. They talk about some of the things that we, you know, kind of went over about, um, you know, the advertising and how they're going to prevent being public nuisance and it's sort of like an introduction um, like when your neighbor moves in and comes right. over and says hey you know we're Bob and Jenny and we moved in next door and these are our kids uh, and then they would go to after they took all that feedback in you know everyone either saying yay welcome to town or oh my goodness we're gonna kill you well whatever it might be they would take that in and then they would go to the Board of Selectmen, who would be the one who negotiates the host community agreement. I have a question. Would that meeting take place in front of us or in front of the Board of Selectmen? Neither. It would be the, an, they an would, independent... They would come to the town and say, we want to open a marijuana establishment. We're going to have a community meeting. Can we use your room? Can we go to the library? Maybe they would rent a venue. Um, and they would be wholly responsible for producing that. Mm -hmm. And they would be wholly responsible for running it. So any involvement of the public or the boards, commissions, et cetera, would be as participants, uh, resident participants. All right. um, they would be, it wouldn't be under the auspices of any government entity. Because, uh, I mean, we run into this with other things, like with the pilot agreements. They come to us with the application, and then they negotiate with the Board of Selectmen. So, well, I'm, I, well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, does the public get the opportunity to review this host agreement and make comments about that, or just at the Board of Selectmen meeting? Or, like, I mean, I've never seen one of these host agreements before. I, so. I would, and, and I, I'll, 
I'll answer and then I'll, I'll look at the other Adam in the back of the room and see if he has a better answer. Uh, but I would expect it would be a, an agreement that is put forth to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, generally with these kind of things, they come in and say, here's what we've drawn up. And the Board of Selectmen looks at it and, and Town Council looks at it and they say, okay, here's what our problems are. Then they talk about what the, the terms are and they kind of come to a general basis. It's a public document at the point that it comes forward to be signed. And at that point, I, I guess it would be up to the selectmen whether or not they accepted comment. And then, you know, I, well, it, it, am I somewhere in the, the ballpark? Can I, can I comment first? Because we've had these before with pile agreements. It's been negotiated by the town manager mostly. They do take input from the public, but it's mostly negotiated by the town manager. The last pilot agreement, I don't feel the Board of Selectmen even really knew much about before they got the final draft. So... But anyways, go ahead, Adam. Sorry. Uh, sure. So um, I think you both got it right in some respects. So uh, like any sort of an agreement with a municipality, often uh, much of the negotiation occurs um, through staff in an effort to try and make things easier. Boards meet on a given night, sometimes relatively infrequently. And so it's not unusual to have a town manager or even other staff involved in that negotiating process. But ultimately, it's a single board that typically has the jurisdiction, the authority to sign that agreement. In most instances, and in the case of marijuana and host community agreements, it's your board of selectmen. So the board of selectmen would have the final say. They're the ones who would vote um, via a majority vote to sign that host community agreement. That vote would need to be taken in an open session. Presumably, there'd be some discussion. And in my experience with these agreements, maybe more so than pilot agreements, that discussion tends to be somewhat substantive. Uh, sometimes it occurs over a series of meetings, but you know it differs case to case. It differs community to community. But it would be the Board of Selectmen that would negotiate that document ultimately and sign it. I presume because they need to do so at a public meeting that there would be an opportunity for public comment, but there is no requirement in the statutory scheme or the regulatory scheme that exists in Massachusetts for a public hearing per se. So there's no hearing at which the public is permitted by right an opportunity to speak. Again, all meetings of the selectmen are open. Uh, I've not seen a meeting in this town of the selectmen that doesn't have a public comment session on it. Uh, so there'd be an opportunity to speak, but there's no public hearing requirement per se. And then there may possibly be like a amendment or, or change to that agreement if somebody were to bring up a valid point to it, it can be revised and Certainly. I mean, there, there are, I've seen a number of these agreements because other communities I represent have negotiated them or in the process of, of negotiating them. Um, they tend to have a certain form. Um, there's certain things that are in these agreements because they've been um, uh, repeated from others. So host community agreements were, were big, uh, not only in the context of things like solar, although those tend to be more so pilots, but uh, um, uh, gambling and, and, and gambling facilities uh, in Massachusetts just a few years ago when when that became uh, lawful, uh, these casinos were negotiating host community agreements, not only with the community in which they would be located, but with some other adjacent communities. And so there are, based upon that, there are certain components of these agreements that we've been seeing time and time again, but then there are unique components town by town, depending upon what it is that they're looking for. Uh, there are certain things that the agreements are required by statute to have. So you heard it referenced in the PowerPoint that there's this concept of a community impact fee. Well, that community impact fee, how it's calculated, for how long it's valid, all of that is dictated by statute. Through the chair, please. Is it possible, depending on how we move forward, uh, for us to have an impact on how the host community agreement is implemented in, in with, with relation to marijuana? Can we as a town pass a regulation that says that, yeah, you, these house community agreements have to, in fact, go in front of the public? Before they're before they're accepted. No, be, because it's uh, option. Sure. So um, uh, the procedural components of the statutory or regulatory scheme are dictated by the legislature. So you couldn't adopt a local requirement that mandates host community agreements get approved following a public hearing. That'd be, I believe, that'd be contrary to the statutory scheme. Typically, with respect to procedures of that sort, the the statute, the regulations at the state level act as both a floor and a ceiling. You can't develop 
uh, more stringent requirements. In terms of the substance of what are in those agreements, um, I think that's certainly something that, that you can be a part of as a planning board. You're not obligated or, or uh, specifically required to be a part of that process by statute or, or by regulation, um, but certainly you can provide your input um, to, the, to the Board of Selectmen. I think it's also important, more so in the marijuana context than another context, to sort of separate the, uh, the zoning and the land use component, that regulation, from the licensing. So the host community agreement is one of the few opportunities that the town has to inject itself into the licensing process. It's its opportunity to, to, to gain some benefits uh, f that will accrue to the town from the development of the facility in the town as part of the licensing process. You still retain all of the authority with respect to zoning and land use mm -hmm. to dictate, even if you opt not to go the route of prohibition, but the route of regulation, you have the ability to dictate where these facilities go, what types of facilities go where, um, and what requirements will be applied the same way that you would with other sorts of manufacturing facilities or retail locations for for uh, products that aren't marijuana. Are the host community agreements for medical and recreational able to be negotiated differently? Are there separate guidelines? So I, I, I should have maybe prefaced my comments, um, but I didn't, didn't want to interrupt um, your flow. But by, by saying that, you know, all of what's been discussed tonight is relatively fluid, and it's becoming um, more and more definitive as we get you know closer. You've, I'm sure you've seen the news and the first license, licenses are now issuing. But this all came about relatively quickly. The legislation's a couple of years old now, but the legislature itself rewrote the referendum um, legislation a year and a half ago. The regulations issued in draft form just before the first of the year, and then they issued in final form just a few months ago. And so there's no case law that interprets any of this. The, what we're going off of, both Adam and I, are the guidance that we've gotten, not only through, in my case, reading the legislation and interpreting it as a lawyer, but also what we're getting from the Cannabis Control Commission and the five commissioners that sit on that commission and the in interpretation they're giving. And if we get into a lengthier discussion, be it tonight or at some future meeting, I'm going to tell you there are a few instances where I disagree with some advice we've gotten from the Cannabis Control Commission. As a lawyer, I don't think that the legislation should be read that way, and I don't think that that would hold up in a courtroom. But we don't know yet because there's been no challenges. There's been no case law to interpret what some of we're reading, what, what, what it means. So, you know, I, I say all that because host community agreements are probably the, the most important component of the legislative scheme for uh, most municipalities. They want to know what can we ask for through these host community agreements? What can we gain as an advantage to the town? And there's some question about how how long these agreements can be good for, the monetary component of those agreements, what it can be, and what sort of justification is really going to be required, and whether there's going to be some sort of audit process for the state to be looking over the shoulders of municipalities and questioning whether or not they can justify these increased costs they're claiming to incur as a consequence of these facilities. So there are many questions that exist with respect to how these agreements get negotiated. I think in the long run, the goal of the legislature is to merge the medical side with the recreational side. We've seen it even in the change from the original legislation that was adopted by referendum vote to the legislation that was re that was rewritten by the legislature to the, the actual regulations that have issued. We've seen a sort of a, a merging of the, the recreational and the medical, so much so that on December 31st of this year, the Cannabis Control Commission will step into the shoes of the Department of Public Health and will be running and not only only the recreational side, but the medical side as well, and DPH will have no involvement any longer. So I think it's only a matter of time, and this is just my opinion, before we see a complete merger of the two schemes. For now, host community agreements have been dealt with in the new legislation the same way for medical as they are for recreational. Okay. And do you feel when we're writing our bylaw that we should leave room for that to be medical to be incorporated because the way i looked at it we should have been writing or thinking about one marijuana bylaw because they're both more or less like you said are going to merge so and, and i think there are multiple approaches and there's also just the reality that i think needs to be acknowledged that you might draft a bylaw and then have to revisit it again in a couple of years depending upon where the legislature goes which over which you have no control that said i i've negotiated a few of these bylaws or, or assisted communities in drafting a few of these bylaws over the past six months um, i did one that was fairly comprehensive in the town of deerfield now deerfield is a very different community than lunenburg but it had some concerns they've got a fair amount of open land agricultural land um, they they wanted to 
to invite cultivation on the one hand because they thought it was good for economic development, but they also wanted to be cautious about where it occurred, and they wanted to be especially cautious about retail locations and how many of them there would be and where they'd be located. And so I crafted a, a, a fairly complex bylaw there because they already had an existing medical marijuana overlay district that they wanted rolled into the new bylaw, such that within that overlay district, which was renamed as a marijuana overlay district, you could not only permit registered marijuana dispensaries, which are the, the medical marijuana facilities, but also certain types of recreational marijuana. But then they also wanted to allow certain other types of recreational marijuana outside of the overlay district. So it was a fairly complex bylaw when all was said and done, but it was structured in a way that um, provided them with the outcome that they wanted um, and gave them the flexibility to control both within the confines of a single bylaw. Thank you. Please I also have on. a question about insurance. Um, so as I was reading the stuff from the Cannabis Control Commission, um, you know, I, I don't really know much about the alcohol licenses, but I do know that you're required to submit a certificate of mm -hmm. insurance to the license to the town. Um, when I was reading the stuff from the Cannabis Control Commission, and I can't remember if it was somewhere else either, but, um, you know, it said basically that all operational marijuana establishments are required to have insurance or if unable to obtain the minimum coverage, place money in escrow to cover any liabilities. I mean, is how, who would be tracking this money if they can't get the insurance to make sure that they're getting? My understanding would be it would be the Cannabis Control Commission and it would be sort of a self-insured sort of situation um, where they're a federally illegal operation so right. they're not going to be able to deal with a lot of banks and some insurance companies aren't going to deal with them. So they have to have cash on hand to put away in the bank. And, you know, it's kind of like when you buy and sell a house and you need to replace the septic system, it goes into escrow. And that's a, a transactional account between the two parties. And I, it's similar between the, the operator and the, the Cannabis Control Commission, correct? So that's my understanding. I, I mentioned before um, the importance of keeping separate the land use scheme uh, from, from the licensing scheme. Um, that can be difficult to do when we start getting into these topics that might be contemplated by a board during the review process for a zoning permit or approval like a special permit when it's already addressed within the state regulations. Um, Again, we don't have much to go on as of yet, but I, I think it's safe to say that in creating so extensive a licensing process, and Adam's slides toward the end there, the ones that you had borrowed from the Cannabis Control Commission were helpful because that was just a glimpse into what is dozens and dozens of pages, it sounds like you've read some of them, of regulations that have been adopted on top of the few dozen pages of statute that address the licensing process primarily. There's, uh, there's, I think, all of two paragraphs in that entire, in, in those dozens of pages that address municipal regulation because they're leaving the land use to all of you. And so the licensing is really what those regulations are about. And it's meant to cover everything from the day-to-day -day operations to security to health and sanitation. All of that is meant to be covered and insurance is one of those items. So would the municipality have the ability to impose a more stringent standard for insurance as let's say a permit condition it's a fair question um, I can tell you that in other contexts where there is a legis legislative scheme that is all-encompassing the courts have said no they've said for example in the building code context um, if the building code says that you've got to have a four-foot fence around a pool and the board says we want you to have a five-foot fence around a pool the board can't impose that requirement because that is delving into the the, the, the legislative scheme that exists that is the Massachusetts State Building Code I could see a similar outcome here where the Cannabis Control Commission or a court says that the Cannabis Control Commission has been established, the legislature has spoken, they've created this scheme for licensing, and they've dictated what the insurance requirements are. And if the town were to impose more stringent requirements, they might be contrary to the concept of permitting these facilities to be developed in Massachusetts. Thank you. Sure. Um, I was also wondering when when there are certain things that it says that the cities and towns may pass bylaws or ordinances, um, one of them is authorizing social consumption in certain areas. They said that towns can do that. Um, if there's a, a on-premises consumption needs a vote, so we would need to, to, to do that. Um, and then there was also one more, they may prohibit or otherwise regulate the possession or consumption 
uh, within a building owned, leased, or occupied by the municipality. So, you know, I would just urge the board to think about that um, when we're making these, you know, bylaws and such with respect to the marijuana. I think it's better to start there and loosen up if things go well, um, rather than be all loose and regret it afterwards. So. And I, I, you know, I, th I made allusion to it. We currently have a general bylaw that prohibits social consumption. Uh, and I think this kind of is, goes to what town council was speaking about. Uh, there was a lot of talk, probably up to like six or nine months ago, about on-premise consumption licenses and social clubs. And uh, my understanding was between that and the non-brick-and-mortar delivery retail service. That was also a big discussion point that the Innovative Control Commission has rolled back and said we're not going to issue licenses for either of those types right now. Uh, we don't see them as part of getting this off the ground. Not to say we won't change our tune in the future, but let's let's permit the you know, the brick and mortar and the, the, the infrastructure stuff that we can wrap our hands around and then we'll move into this other stuff that seems to be sort of causing a lot of uproar. Uh, and I think if I recall the legislation correctly, social consumption requires a ballot initiative on a, is it a national uh, or at least a statewide uh, ballot? So if they, they're not issuing licenses now, we'd be probably into like, you know, 2020 before we're looking at that as being a potential uh, license to go forward and a potential use to go forward. Am I somewhere in the ballpark? R right. So the the challenge here is distinguishing between public consumption generally and social consumption. So as Adam had said, from a public consumption perspective, you've already got a, a regulation on the books. Social consumption, it really confused all of us lawyers because we reviewed the draft regulations that the Cannabis Control Commission issued before the first of the year. And they spent several pages addressing these social consumption operations, they call them essentially marijuana cafes. And I even saw some news stories. In fact, I think the first one was proposed in Worcester. They were proposing to essentially have a lounge with couches and they were going to allow people to bring in their own marijuana and spend the evening, spend a few hours, smoke your marijuana and go home afterwards. Um, these social consumption operations were something that were addressed in great detail in the regulations. Then they issued the final regulations two and a half, three months later after they had a series of public hearings in different communities and social consumption was gone. It wasn't addressed any longer. In fact, they, they, I think they missed two errant references that are still in there, but it's not a defined term. It's not, but th if you look back at the old version, the draft regulations that issued, you'll see that they addressed it in great detail. The explanation they gave for that is, it got too confusing, and it, we're going to have to spend much more time addressing the issue. We're just not prepared to do that on such a short time frame, and so we're postponing it. I don't know where that really leaves us, except knowing that there's not going to be any licenses that issue for those sorts of facilities anytime in the near future. They've not set out a timetable for when they intend to revise the regulations or address social consumption in a more extensive way. And you said that the retail licenses are the only ones that can be restricted in the town correct so if we have eight then that puts us at 1.6 so essentially two well two would put us over 20 percent and my understanding of it I is think that it's minimum that would avoid us from needing to do a ballot measure because we're not restricting less than 20 percent but we're able to then still restrict and if i'm not mistaken that's a general bylaw Right. We've, we've recommended that our communities adopt both general and zoning bylaws because there is an opinion from the Attorney General that has suggested that certain things need to be done by one and can't be done by the other. So we adopt bylaws that mimic one another in some respects. Um, the general bylaw tends to be much simpler. Um, but that's, that's what we've recommended in, in the communities that we represent, that they, they do both. And we can limit over 20% without the need for the, the ballot. Right, the idea is that if you're going to either outright prohibit either all marijuana establishments or certain any single category of marijuana establishment or essentially affect a regulation that amounts to a de facto prohibition, it's so stringent, it's so extreme that you're really prohibiting the, the use altogether, that you can only do that by way of ballot. They've made it they've made it difficult in those communities that voted yes 
to pro outright prohibit the legislature has said well you've made a determination already by way of a by way of a, a, a popular vote that this should be something that's permitted in your, in your community and so if you want to go back on that you've got to proceed with this belt and suspenders approach you not only need to go to the to the ballot box again but you've also got to adopt it through town meeting procedures um, and so that doesn't mean you can't place restrictions on it so I, I heard the question you asked about prohibition you could define in your community let's say that you lived in a community that had a residential district a commercial district and an industrial district you could say that all types of marijuana facilities are only allowed in the industrial district you've prohibited them in residential and in commercial <laughs> that would be legitimate and you wouldn't need to go to the ballot box to do that assuming that your industrial district didn't consist of five properties or assuming that your industrial district wasn't 10 acres except that you've got three schools that are here here and here and such the <laughs> radius they overlap one another you, you can't affect the de facto prohibition of the use but you can you can place fairly substantial limitations on it or restrictions on it and still not run afoul of the statute so in terms of limits on the establishments you can limit them as long as as long as you don't go below 20 percent in which case you then have to go to the ballot but is box. that only retail because it, it seems like everything i read says retail. retail retail so basically the other the cultivators and the manufacturers there's no limit other than where you choose to allow them okay so you can do that either by limiting them to an overlay district that is small in size you can do it by opening up to your existing zoning districts or a certain certain number of them but then requiring based upon dimensional standards that they be only on parcels of five acres or more um, you've done this before with other uses connections to utilities you know having the ability to have water and sewer um, that limits where they are Right. So if you allow a use on in a district, and that district is comprised of 200 acres and, and, and 500 parcels, um, you're not going to get 500 facilities if you require a minimum five acres and you require 300 feet of frontage. And you start imposing those requirements, you can go through and start to you know, narrow down the number of sites where it realistically could occur. Now, there's always a possibility in individual combined sites. It's like any other use. You can do that analysis, or Adam can do that analysis, <laughs> um, and get a sense as to how many you could legitimately get. But you are correct. There's no limitation, no 20% standard with respect to the other marijuana establishments that are not retail. Right, as long as they're within whatever bylaws that come up. Correct. Does the board have any indication as to when they might have a draft of... I think our target is for September okay. um, to, you know, this was sort of the initial, let's hear from the public and boy, did we get a response. Uh, oh, <laughs> I mean, we're going to be having a draft prior to, yes, I mean, I, we'll I mean, be I, working I think, on it. I think and, the idea is to work on it through right. the summer mm -hmm. with a draft proposal for September. Um, and one thing I, I unfortunately neglected to mention in, in my slides is, um, and this has really developed over the last week. Uh, the Attorney General has approved a moratorium. I don't remember where it was. It was, it was somewhere out, you know, cent central East Massachusetts that uh, it goes through uh, July of 2019. Uh, essentially saying that uh, based on the way that the regulations came down and the way that licensing is going that you know, it's reasonable to feel that this community needs that additional year at this point to uh, plan and, and judge how they want to regulate a marijuana establishment. So uh, ultimately, you know, if we spend the summer going through this, I mean, I, it seems like there's a lot of people in different sides of the coin tonight. Uh, and we spend the summer arguing about it and you know we put our best effort in we just really can't get something done for special town meeting you know we could look at amending our current moratorium through annual town meeting for the purposes of having a longer planning process to hash out the work that we've been doing uh, I mean uh, you know I, I just a little bit it, it doesn't seem like we're getting a lot of interest right now uh, I think once you actually throw out a bylaw that says here's kind of what we've shaped, that tends to be the thing that gets people to kind of come out and say, oh, we like or don't like that. And, um, you know, so I, I, you know, I would expect that this really should start taking shape in mid-August um, with the intent of trying to, to finalize and, and, and shape it into September to really start saying here's the direction the planning board has gone at this point and um, what do people actually think about this? 
we'll be doing all this in public meetings too when all our drafts we get are public records so if you want to view them by all means just ask and we can and do, with the respect for the you know the buffer zones and such that you know the the medical marijuana is more restrictive than what the non-medical is right now um, that is something that the town cannot change so that's a fair question if I if I could through you Please. Um, it's a fair question and that's I mentioned before that there are a few instances where I might actually disagree with the Cannabis Control Commission's own interpretation of the statute or or its regulations which of course must be in tune with the statute so um, the statute doesn't say exactly that. Um, I've seen guidance documents, and in fact, I heard that it was a statement was made at a presentation given by a couple or one of the commissioners and another uh, attorney who practices uh, in this area of the law um, uh, for a, a planning organization. A statement was made that you could include um, a buffer that was less restrictive, but not a buffer that was more restrictive. That was a surprise to me. And so I've talked about it with some of my colleagues in my office and outside of my office, and we're of a different opinion. Our, from our perspective, if you have the ability to go in and to adopt zoning that would outright restrict these uses in certain districts or to craft an overlay district and place that overlay district wherever you want it so long as it's not affecting a de facto prohibition in your community then who's to say you can't adopt a more stringent buffer zone? Aren't you doing the same thing? Couldn't you identify those buffers and then include the layer area, all of the area in your community outside of those buffers and call that your overlay district? It seems to me that you could certainly do that and that that would be a legitimate use of the zoning power and not run afoul of the regulation. So how is it then that the Cannabis Control Commission can say you can't adopt a more stringent buffer zone? So I think that you can, but I'm aware that the Cannabis Control Commission has guidance documents out there that say that you can't, that you can make it less restrictive but not more restrictive. It just doesn't make sense to me that for the medical marijuana, you, there's a, a like, a, for daycares, there's like, you know, you can go in with your license, medical license, and get it and purchase, but, you know, 22-year-old Steve can walk into something that's next to a daycare and purchase it and walk out with no, you know, no, no medical reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I, if that is possible uh, down the line to do, to include daycares, kindergartens, you know, and I know it gets a little funky with the where children congregate and all of that, but I, I think as much of a buffer that we can provide for anyone that is under 21 would be effective. And I, I suspect what you see is the difference between the legislature writing a law yes. and an industry advocate writing a ballot question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, legislators theoretically protecting their constituency and the advocate is looking to make it as easy as possible to interpret and understand what, where, and when. But that's an interesting qu point because you can't uh, you can't regulate where uh, daycare goes. Well, it, it's pre-existing. Right. So if they came in afterwards, the they're okay. Okay. So it's pre-existing, but the, the 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 explanation they gave for why they changed it with the recreational was that it's difficult to define, as Adam alluded to, where children congregate. Uh, what about bus stops now? So there's a bus stop in every corner. Is that an area where children <coughs> congregate? They're there for three hours every morning between the three bus stop pickups. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why then daycares would drop out because daycares, it seems to me, are pretty easy to identify where they exist. They need to be licensed. There's a licensing scheme the same way that you can identify where K through 12 exists. So why wouldn't daycares remain in? Um, but I, I, I came across in the medical context some challenging instances where we had proposals in communities only to find out that there was a dance academy that was a short distance away and that was considered an area where children congregate. So I can understand how that yeah. vagary in the in the medical legislation was challenging, um, but I, I I can't understand how it is that municipalities can have their hands tied and not be permitted to create greater, lengthier or or, or uh, larger mm. um, distance requirements, buffer requirements from these facilities. I think we're planning to have town council participate more in this bylaw than we normally would in another one. Um, I am, anyways. Uh, We've dealt with it before. The applicants find the loophole. You know, we deny it. They lawyer up and then fight us in court. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to avoid, and we're also trying to protect the town, too. I mean, I have three kids that live here, so. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you for having this listening session, even mm. though attendance was low, but at least 
I have to oh, apologize. I thought it was going to be a more impersonal setting. I thought we were going to be sitting all at a table and interacting together, so I have to apologize for that. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, Katie Adams Williams Drive, and these are just my personal opinions um, that I'll share. Um, first, I would prefer that we would at least consider restricting it. Um, in regards to the 53% in question four passing, I don't think that the 53% represent 53% that maybe were pro pot shop or pro cultivation. Somebody may have voted yes because they wanted to decriminalize it. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it did pass, and I'm not going to question close margins. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I got it. Oh, it's to give a minute, Dave. Slow on that. I'll take that. <laughs> um, no, but still, just to sort of look at that 53% and not, not I've heard of officials before say, well, it passed by 53%, 53% wanted it, but to know that what each voter wanted may have been something different. Um, it may represent just that they wanted to grow some or they wanted to use it or they wanted to decriminalize it, maybe not even for themselves because someone they know, you, I mean, there's so many reasons somebody may have voted yes on four. It doesn't directly say that 53% of people want to bring large scale I, marijuana into town. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I guess that's a question. How, who would initiate a prohibition ballot? Either Would the town have the ability, like the Board of Selectmen? I know the residents have the ability to do it with signatures. And the, the, Interestingly, they don't. So the, the residents have the ability to place a non-binding question on an initiative ballot. They don't have the ability to, quas to place the marijuana question on the ballot or any other binding question, for okay. that matter, on a who, ballot. Who does? The selectmen, and only selectmen? the selectmen. Okay. That's correct. But the selectmen could put the question on the ballot. Uh, obviously, to get to town meeting, it could be proposed. A, 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 a prohibition bylaw would be proposed, could be proposed by the planning board and submitted to the selectmen for inclusion on the town meeting warrant. Um, but that's a question that we should get back to it that goes to timing as well. I mean, I, I understand Adam's advocating for, you know, why continue to delay this, and I, I'm, I'm fully supportive of that. Let's, let's get ahead of it and let's do that now. But, of course, if you're going to go the route of a prohibition, you have to pair the ballot question with the town meeting vote. And so question whether there's going to be a special election then that you would have to hold in the fall in order to pair it or whether you'd vote the bylaw in the fall and then still wait until until next May for the election to occur to see whether the ballot question passes. And then you are putting all that eggs in that basket. If the prohibition doesn't pass and you haven't also adopted a bylaw that restricts the use in some way, well, now you're left without any regulation at all. So Deerfield's another good example. What they did in Deerfield is they adopted both. Right. They went the route of a rule, or they put both on the ballot. They put a prohibition, but they also put a restriction. So at least if the restriction passed, which it did, they knew that if they didn't get the vote on the prohibition, which they didn't, that they'd have the restriction in place. So having yeah, a... Gonna, oh, can, sorry. I was just going to say, can the ballot be structured as an either or? So have, have, the, have the restriction by law, have the prohibition by law, get them both voted in a, a town meeting to say that they will be on the ballot, and then have you choose A or B. So you can't place a restriction. First of all, you don't need to. And second of all, you can't place the restriction on the ballot. You're simply placing the prohibition on the ballot. And there's very specific language that the legislature has dictated you place on the ballot, accompanied by uh, an explanatory paragraph, certification by town council. It's very specific as to what it has to say. So, so the question on the ballot will be, do you support an outright prohibition of the following marijuana establishments or all marijuana establishments? And it's a yes or a no. And if it's yes, and 51% vote yes in favor of the prohibition, then that passes. And as long as you've also passed the prohibition bylaw at town meeting before or after, it's prohibited. If that so, fails, you hope you have something else in place. So what happens to the restriction bylaw just becomes obsolete? Right. Think of you, all the time you'd save. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I'd rather have it not need it than need it not have it. Well, it would be interesting to see because then you'd have that piece of data on how people actually right. feel. Um, but that, I, that was just my personal preference. And really the reason is, and I've been mulling this over for over a year now, I spoke about it at public comment here last year, and it's the goal of any commercial enterprise coming to town or anybody doing business is to profit, and the only way to profit in this scenario is by increasing drug use in a community, um, and I don't see any reason long term why that's a good thing. Um, increasing drug use, we're really increasing impairment, 
and people make a lot of parallel to alcohol in terms of it being a, a way to impair, but there's so much with alcohol, like being able to um, find the blood levels and connect that to OUIs, and that doesn't exist yet for marijuana. Um, and then there's the part where, um, you know, if under a certain age, it's, if there's permanent cognitive impairment for people doing marijuana. I know there's, I mean, I don't know if you want to look at Facebook as a valid source, but there's parents on there on the Lunenburg Community School sites worrying about vaping and, and people vaping their little, big, uh, little pens and little... Uh, flash drives and I asked my sister who's a high school teacher well, where do they get those they devices? should be here oh, not from on the Facebook. pot shops and so these things that are already in our high school are coming from these spaces and I, I think legalizing it has made it easier for youth to participate in and when I go back to the 53 percent that's 53 percent of registered voters and it leaves out the most important part of the population that this will ultimately affect and it's those that don't vote, all of our kids. And that's really where I think of it. My oldest are 10-year-olds and watching them go through a space where something being sold in a store looks like it's more favorable, hands down, from when we grew up. We knew it wasn't favorable if it was sort of being snuck around or something. And so setting the expectation for me that this isn't a path I want for my kids, that's why my preference would be just say, hey, we're not into increased drug use in Lunenburg. Um, and I guess that's my personal opinion. I'll keep saying that because <laughs> I don't know how this will play out, but I would be happy to have it as any of my opinions. So, all right. Can, oh. If I could react to and some of the sure, things. Sure. I actually agree with um, what she, with uh, her first comment that I know a lot of people who, you know, uh, went into that referendum thinking, you know, just philosophically, yeah, I agree. But I don't think anyone, you know, outside of like some crazed madman could figure out what the state of Massachusetts is going to come back to you with, with laws and everything else and all the possibilities you know what I mean and I would agree with her on that point that it's worth at least you know um, looking looking into a little further um, and I had some follow-up questions maybe not for you but maybe for the chief about um, those specific questions how do we you know, how much, what do we test? What do you test as, as, as a policing agency? Do you test THC levels? Is there any kind of nomin uh, you know, normal things that you would check for? Is it even gonna be illegal to be under the influence? Uh, those kinds of questions are. And can I, can I put in one last thing? Cause I think it'll go to you is, um, it says what cost do you anticipate? is something that it, it put in there with the 3%, and I think all that would be a question that we should talk about is what you would anticipate this will all cost us if there's more to regulate on your end. Okay. But I had follow-up questions to the, uh, for town council about that very same point, about who's going to be in charge of, is each department going to you know, be responsible for uh, keeping tabs on its own costs or how that's going to work? But sorry, I actually kind of had the same question along the lines of the host community agreement. How do we quantify the community impact. I mean, that information has to come from the chief on policing. I mean, there's education, yeah. outreach, yeah. recovery, whatever, treatment, I mean, so we need to figure that out. But sorry, go ahead, Chief. I mean, just up in my shoes, how, how do you quantify that at this point? You know, we can draw some lessons from some of the other states that have already uh, legalized marijuana, such as Colorado. Washington, California, but the, you know, there's, there's still not a lot of data out there. So uh, to answer your question, I, at this point, I have no idea, no idea okay. whatsoever. Is um, it, uh, is there a, I mean, is it, number one, is it going to be, do you know if it's going to be illegal to drive under the influence of, or at some level? It already is. It's illegal to drive under the influence anyway. It's just. So how do you test that? The challenge comes in. In testing, and uh, yeah. there isn't a, a reliable way to test yet. I know that there's there's um, some research being done right now with respect to testing saliva. Mm -hmm. THC only, I think, survives uh, in the mouth for up to two hours, I believe. Okay. So that test may not be reliable. I mean, as it is, even with alcohol, you know, there's, there's these issues such as. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of the term, uh, legal term, maybe you can help me out here, 
Uh, well, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know where you're going. Yeah, we might not. Uh, <clears throat> retrograde. Uh, um, uh, retrograde. Uh, well, at any rate, let me let me explain what, where I'm going with this. Even when you're drinking, you know, if you, once you stop, uh, your body begins to metabolize the alcohol and it, and it begins to uh, reduce in amount. Mm -hmm. uh, retrograde extrapolation is something that uh, lawyers will bring up in OUI cases because if we wait, say, an hour or two hours to do a breathalyzer test after the fact, then there's this retrograde extrapolation going on. That's where your body's getting rid of alcohol. Um, so the actual uh, amount uh, varies, uh -huh. and it would with THC. THC is a different, totally different animal. It, uh, it lives in the mouth, I think, for up to two hours, but it can it can survive in your cells for up to 30 days. The mm. problem is, is um, we need to know while you're driving the car, when you were driving the car, were you under the influence then? Yeah. Um, a common scenario you've probably heard with alcohol is a person will get in an accident and get out of the car and run home and then the police will go to their house. And, you know, the guy is clearly drunk, but then he says, yeah, I just had a couple beers when I got home. We don't know that he did or not. Yeah. So we can't connect his consumption of alcohol sometimes uh, with the timing of driving the car mm -hmm. that becomes a difficult or a challenging thing in a defense or, or in a prosecution rather um, so the, so the, I guess the long answer to your question is no okay. <laughs> we don't know how to deal with it yet yeah um, can I ask you a follow-up question if if um, do you know if anybody keeps statistics on i don't even know if there is such a thing as a as a marijuana related you know vehicle death but well, is there anybody who keeps statistics on stuff like i that? have in front of me uh, an example of that it's it's a study that was done by the world health organization on the effects of uh, non-medical cannabis social and physical and health effects and uh, they speak to that and nobody would disagree with them because i've heard this story before the answer is not accurately because most data concerning uh, people who uh, operate on the influence of uh, anything mm -hmm. usually is related to alcohol. So we don't, where we can't test for marijuana and we can only test for alcohol, the data, there is really limited data. Yeah. Occasionally, somebody will actually admit to smoking marijuana or, and with that admission they may have marijuana on them they may have marijuana burning in the car at the time of the accident it becomes mm. circumstantial evidence uh, and on occasion the jury will uh, prosecute based on that evidence on that circumstantial evidence but it's very rare so there's the data is is limited very limited because of that so, okay, thank so you. even if we don't have any of these types of facilities in town I mean, it's you're still, still going to need additional well, no, equipment gonna, and training. Well, no, what I'm saying is yes. people are going to be driving through town impaired regardless of whether they have them here or not. But Well, that's true, I mean, but, but why as uh, Katie pointed out, why increase um, the odds? No, I hear what you're saying, but even as it sits now without any here, do you need more training, more equipment for these types of things to identify Well, we them? need, we, uh, we have the training, which now that's under scrutiny as well. Because uh, I believe you need to be like a drug trained. recognition expert. Drug, that's right, and that's been scrutinized lately. In fact, as you can't even, well, with respect to alcohol right now, you can't submit a breathalyzer test in the state. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing right now. So, obviously, you know, we've met with, even more challenges where uh, the um, drug recognition training is under scrutiny. But yes, it'll require, it, I'm sure down the road, it's going to require even more training with respect to drug recognition. And um, if there's ever some kind of chemical test, they'll have, you know, there'll be training in that area as well. And I'm sure that'll uh, be costly. You know, that's something that, you know, that'll be a, an unfunded mandate or whatever, and town will end up paying for that is i think a bigger picture here though um i, I mean i'm i can't come up here and justify any of this obviously uh, i mean i'm bound uh, to uh just not not even as a, a law enforcement officer just my as a citizen 
I respect federal law. It's federally prohibited. We all know that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the voters in Massachusetts, uh, whether accurately or not, it was, they, 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 they made it known that they wanted this legalized. I can't even wrap my head around that. I can't imagine why somebody would want to put something on fire in their mouth to begin with. Or even ingest it. I mean, I've got, I, you know, I took some, I get these notices from the DEA every day about cases where people eat edibles and they're doing synthetic marijuanas and, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the you know, the cases where they're hospitalized or there's, you know, some kind of issue uh, with over, overdose or poisoning and so on and so forth. This is literally daily. Uh, we've had at least in the last uh, three in as, as many uh three in as many weeks uh, uh incidents related to the ingestion of marijuana one very very violent suicide um so this this is the you know this this isn't the abstract part of this is the real part of my business uh i, I mean that's why i do this if i wanted abstract i would have become a psychologist but uh I'm not i'm a cop and i see what's real you know and, let me relate something back to you about the reality of this business and, and you know, something you'll never be able to see, you can't see through my lens. I've mean, got 39 years in law enforcement. This gentleman that spoke at public comment, he, he was humble about that because he wasn't hit by a drunk driver. He was killed by a drunk driver. The only reason he's standing here today is because the Lunenburg Fire Department saved his life. They brought him back to life but he was actually dead. That was the year I came on. Um, and of course you could see he's handicapped. Yeah. He wasn't hit, he was actually run over. Um, so, you know, his, he, what he relates to you that's real, um, you know, his story about, and we've all done that many times, try to help people out, because that's what we do. Uh, but these, you know, those are real cases that people cannot relate to. And when, you know, when they step into a voter's booth, they're not thinking like the police are. But the point I'm trying to make is, just that all aside, you know, I'd like to come up here and say all kinds of negative things uh, about it. And I don't because I have to be as objective about all of these things as possible. Uh, and the other side of that is even as objective as I can be about it, I, my ultimate goal is the protection of life and property. Uh, we know, we all know, I mean, we can't deny that alcohol, drugs, uh, just is, um, and creates a, a huge amount of death and destruction. Uh, that, again, you'll never really understand until you can see it through our lens. Um, so all I can do is caution you Follow the money. Do some research. I don't care if you smoke pot or not. No, I would never judge anybody by that. Whether you do or not, follow the money that got us to this point. And I think you might have a different outlook about why this got to the point it did. Um, I think the American public, and I think you'll agree if you really do the research, that we've all been misled. Um, and... I firmly believe and you know that uh, it's further created the vision in this country you know we're all we're all concerned about building or creating uh, manufacturing companies that will produce marijuana and we're all um, you know we're, we're all and I, I get this where we're seduced beyond belief by the amount of money. I mean, there's, I believe, $58 million made last year in this industry and crazy money, you know, but it's not about the money, you know, it's about uh, freedom. And I see that this is one of a few issues I think that is a real threat to national security. Um, we can't even manufacture anything in this country anymore. And we want to grow marijuana Boeing can't make a wing for their new plane. They got to give it to the Chinese when we have people perfectly capable of doing that in this country. But yet they gave that to the Chinese to build? American company? 
That's absurd. So do the research and follow the money that made this legal. And there's a lot of it. The likes of Hugh Hafter and George Soros. Manipulating the American public. And deceiving, and if you do the research, you'll understand that. Before you even decide what you're going to do with this bylaw, do some research. Read this document. This is real stuff based on not anecdotal. This is, they, they have evidence here. The guy that was driving that car, <clears throat> that uh, ran over John Baker. Um, we don't know that he was smoking dope, but uh, you know, this, this study here makes one of the most logical comments. I, I had to highlight it. Uh, the difference between users and non-users of cannabis products. Uh, users are more likely to use alcohol, tobacco, and other illicit drugs than people who do not use cannabis. And, they differ from non-users in risk-taking, impulsivity, cognitive ability, in other ways that increase the risk of adverse health outcomes such as accidents, using other illicit drugs, or perform performing poorly in school. Is that the society we want to raise when we can try to raise a society that's sold? But, you know, think about all that while you're creating a bylaw that I know is you have your boundaries with respect to the law that was uh, or the CMR that was produced by the Cannabis Control Commission. I get that. There's a huge picture here. I think you got to consider when you do this. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> I just wanted to also comment on the same if I could. Please. Uh, I guess echo what the chief and uh, Mrs. Adams have said that, you know, when it comes to Lunenburg, and just to bring it back home to who we are, um, you know, is that part of our brand? Selling more drugs, getting more drugs out there for our kids? I don't know. It's what we're trying to determine yeah. with these. <laughs> right. So I just want to things, say that. Honestly, I mean, I have my personal opinions on it, but they're kind of irrelevant when it yeah. comes to drafting the bylaw. The fact of the matter is we have to write one. Understood. Um, so. But how do we also get the question before the people? That's my opinion. <laughs> Very Therein lies the challenge. I mean, Mrs. Adams commented that there's, there's a lot of people on Facebook. They should be here. Yeah, they should. Honestly. Yeah, I agree. So, well, there's currently a, uh, a Survey Monkey question out there. Did we get any definitive results from that? Well, I mean, <laughs> not definitive, but I, have we I, I don't know that a Survey Monkey survey is um, ever definitive. No, um, I know, but I'm just asking if there was. It, I mean. Are we going to get a report from it? Yeah, okay. when we decide to close it, which okay. I expect would be sometime after the upcoming holiday. Um, I looked at it maybe last week, beginning of last week, uh, and there was a hundred and some odd responses, and it, you know they kind of crossed the spectrum, but it it seemed as though prohibition was the least preferred option in, in a lot of cases. Um, I, I, you know, I've heard some uh, feedback on the survey that it was uh, maybe hard to understand or hard to approach. Uh, and, and I did try to correct that a little bit by, by linking in the zoning map. Um, I think there's, and, you know, shame on me for this, but I, I you know, I, I hoped more people understood the difference between site plan and special permit. And I, I guess when you live in that world, it's, it's hard to fathom that nobody knows what the difference is, uh, you know, one being, you know, a, a, an objective standard based on the bylaw site plan approval that, you know, if you meet these things, we say yes. Uh, if you don't or can't, then we say no. Uh, where a spe special permit is, is more subjective and uh, is, a, is a very property by property, case by case, uh, what are the merits of this in context of the surrounding area type of approval. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, the tough thing about SurveyMonkey is once you send that thing out there, there's not a lot of editing you can do to, to make people, uh, to add to it, to really give um, background. So. Yeah, I don't put like 
Oh, my heart and faith no, I, into I, him. I, I, I don't consider it a town meeting vote, but it's no, something it's, to consider. And, and, and I think that's exactly what it is. It's it's sort of, um, you know, it's kind of like a weather vane. It's not telling you exactly where the wind's blowing, but it, it gives you a, a pretty good idea. I, I think we have a... I think we have an opportunity here as well. So, just like the uh, the, the village district, there was a, a significant amount of selling that went into what this board did to do what we thought was in the best interest of the town. Um, and so, I think we we could also take the same approach with this, with whatever bylaw we come up with. There's a degree of selling that mm -hmm. we would have to do to garner support for it. Um, I'm, I'm on the opinion that at the very least we should shoot for a bilateral type solution where we have a prohibition by law and a backup restriction by law yeah. that if we fail on prohibition we would be able to have a, a backup in place for restriction and then ultimately the town gets to decide what we want to have in this town and we can certainly um, through through the course of public hearings and inviting the public and sharing um, share opinions or have townspeople share their opinions of which approach is better um, but I do think that we should have that option out there such that the, the town does have the final say in what the outcome is I agree, definitely. You don't want to get caught with nothing, right, on the books because that's when you really get kicked <coughs> around, right? And it, it doesn't become by right everywhere. Anything they want, anywhere. Uh, through you, um, please. Uh, no, it, it would become a permissible use in those locations where um, the use would be deemed permissible if it were likened to something else in your use table. So, if it's a manufacturing facility for manufacturing marijuana, it'd be permitted. Other sorts of manufacturing facilities are allowed. There may be some instances where an argument could be made that it's by right. Like, what about cultivation? The closest thing you've got in your bylaw to cultivation is agriculture, and we know it's not agriculture, right? So, where is cultivation allowed? You could make an argument that it's allowed everywhere on the basis that it's closest to an exempt use. Cultivation is something that often occurs in residential districts, and therefore can occur in less intense dist districts as well. Right to farm community. Yeah, we're right to farm community. <laughs> right. So, so th you certainly there's certainly a danger there if you have no restriction, no regulation as a backup. So, the prohibition's an easy document to draft. You could do that in. Uh, a half an hour meeting Adam could sit down and prepare for you in advance it's probably a minor tweak to your bylaw that specifies either adding it to to your table of uses and putting ends for no across the board or in some other manners just including a provision that explicitly states it's prohibited um, so that's easy to do if you're going to outright prohibit all types of marijuana establishments in your community the regulations what really is the challenge is finding you know d deciding where you want to place these facilities different types of facilities and what uh, you know what what schedule of the uh, intensity uh, dimension density you want to apply to the individual uses depending upon where they're located I have a question for council um, I, I thought I heard you say that um, if the prohibition was to be enacted that it needed to be a ballot question and then a town meeting question could, could the, the order doesn't matter. It, the order doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. That, that was my question. That town meeting first, and right. then have a ballot exactly. follow okay. up thirty days later. Thank you. I misunderstood the first. Thing. Yes. A, if you, if you have the town meeting, of course, the the issue is it's convenient if you if you have the ballot first because you know whether it. I mean, I guess either way, you've got to print the warrant, but it makes it simpler at town meeting because if your prohibition passes on the ballot and you have that warrant article first and it passes at town meeting, you can just skip over the whole regulation at town meeting. If your town meeting's first, you sort of have to adopt both on the premise and say so specifically at town meeting or explicitly at town meeting that you're adopting the regulation as well as a prohibition and if the ballot question passes that the prohibition will supersede the regulation the regulation will be no, of no force and effect mm. and also if the prohibition fails at the ballot you also know that when you hit town meeting and if you if you were to do if, it you, if you do the ballot first right yeah right uh, and now being that it's midterms this fall we could theoretically do the prohibition as part of the midterm ballot and put a prohibition on at the special town meeting, which generally comes towards the mid to end of November, which would be after such election. That's true. And you could uh, arguably, 
um, your your moratorium runs end of the calendar year. Uh, December 1st. December 1st. So you could arguably extend the moratorium if you opted to. If you weren't prepared to adopt the regulation, mm-hmm. you could go the route of, route of a prohibition for your special. And if the prohibition failed and you extended your moratorium, you'd still have an opportunity to finalize to, regulation. To, to zone for the use and to finalize a regulation before July of next year. So That's half our another. warrant is going to be covered in marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and to extend the moratorium, can make it out of it. What's that? Yes. The yes. Moratorium. Yeah, that'd be a modification to the existing moratorium. So, and again, if if we ordered them in such a way that it was prohibition, regulation, moratorium, if that's how the board goes, and you either pass prohibition or fail, pass regulation or fail, extend moratorium. Uh, is like the the catch all at the end. How did the how did the <coughs> initial moratorium go? It's Flying like, colors. Yeah, it it was pretty much unanimous, right? Yeah, I, I mean, well, that, there was a little bit uh, of discussion, but not a lot. Are they putting a limit on how long of a moratorium you can place on it? Or yeah, I mean, if you came in and said it? we're well, going to go to twenty thirty, I well, think right, exactly. would well, say no. Well, that's what I mean. Are they putting? <laughs> can we do it for a year, or is it six months? Or are they limiting any kind of extension? Oh, I, I think July is as far as you want to go. So right. the general rule with moratoria, and this goes back to moratoria that existed for you know cell towers way back um, before the Federal Telecommunications Act took full control. Uh, it goes back to moratorium for um, for wind turbines and other sorts of uh, rate of development bylaws. The rule of thumb was you needed a valid planning purpose to justify the moratorium. And how long does that planning really require you to take? So there have been moratoria that have been allowed for as long as two full years. Um, generally, you see them more often six months to a year. A year is pretty common because it's a year between town meetings, between annual town meetings. Um, but we know that there's been one in this, this very context that's been allowed through July of 2019. So that tells you that that would likely pass muster at the AG's office if you were to do that, so long as you could uh, present the justification that you're undergoing a planning process in the interim, which obviously we're doing by starting this conversation tonight. And I also think that, you know, failing a vote of a regulatory bylaw at a town meeting to then extend the moratorium is, you know, that all that information a- ends up at the AG's office, so it's just further backup for, we really need this extra well, six months. Well, that's the other thing. If we don't prohibit and the bylaw doesn't pass, what happens? That's, I, I would say we would add the moratoria extension on there as a third, and if it's right. unnecessary, so you just pass it over. Mm. Again, because there might be enough people saying we don't want it all, we're not even going to vote yes for a bylaw, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then we're stuck with deferring to state law, basically. Good point. That's not my impression of Lunenburg, though. <laughs> Can I go to the zoning bylaw compliance for a second and get some? I, I, well, no, I didn't mean out of spite or any reason like that. Can I just mean that they might no, not just, agree with the bylaw, you know? I, I, mean, I understand that. It's just I, I, I haven't heard a lot of people. Actually, you know, all the people that I've talked to about this in many different circles, I haven't heard anybody that's a big proponent of opening up a lot of facilities in the mm-hmm. for this purpose. I think a lot of people fall into the same category that Ms. Adams was di- discussing, whereas they were more concerned about personal use and prosecution um, at a state level, yeah. but not being able to you know run down a CVS next door and grab a, a dime bag or something. Right. So, um, you know, it's my impression from the people that I've talked to so far, so far, that a moratorium wouldn't be out of the question uh, for Lunenburg, I and mean, so you have to drive to Fitchburg if you really want to consume. You mean a prohibition? You already, you already, yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, prohibition. Um, you already can grow your own, um, so and you already can have possession and not be illegal. Um, so, you know, why do you want to have the shops? Uh, in the center of town or, or around town. Well, and I'd just like to kind of <clears throat> pick up on that theme and say that, you know, two years ago, there was no context for any of this. Mm-hmm. So you could have voters that were voting to decriminalize, but now in the context of all of the licensing coming forth and knowing that it's happening right next door in Fitchburg and so on, now a voter has a much better idea of sure. like where things are at. And I think we owe it to them to at least give them the choice. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. I, I think a choice is is exactly what we want to do. <clears throat> Z- 
zoning oh sorry zoning bylaw compliance if um you just are, is the assumption that they've already gotten a they've already received a no it's not no okay um already received a, a permit a permit yeah no the, the answer is no and, and that but that was a fair question and it was a question after the draft regulations went out well after the statute I mean, from was adopted. Us, a special permit right so yeah. there, there was a question when this when this language first found its way into i think it was in the statute first and then it wasn't clarified by the first round of regulations and so they've clarified it in the final regulations and they've clarified it in their in their guidance documents the question was by uh, requirement of municipal certification of compliance what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that all permits and approvals have issued? Because that process can take some time. And the answer from the Cannabis Control Commission is no, that's not how it's interpreted. What it means is that the municipality has to certify that it is a permissible use. So if you were to adopt zoning that would prohibit it in the residential district, yep. any sort of marijuana establishment, and, and a, a cultivator comes forward and wants to propose a project, and you say, where's your site? And it's in on a residential site, the obvious answer is no it's not permitted there you can't allow it if you wanted to and so you would have you couldn't certify compliance in that instance it doesn't mean that all permits and approvals have issued it can be subject to their issuance and should be subject to their issuance yes yeah. so it's kind of like an a and r you're just saying that it's got it it meets the general it, yeah exactly requirements that's a, that's a that's, that's a fair comparison okay. yeah i had a question about the impact agreement and also the tax revenue as i understand it the state has outlined that marijuana sales at the retail level will be subject to the six and a quarter percent sales tax a ten and three quarter percent excise tax and then locally we could opt to adopt a three percent tax is that in addition to whatever percentage is negotiated in the impact agreement Please. Um, so, so the answer is yes, but there there's a few caveats, and so I want to want to clarify a few things about the host community agreements because it, it's an important component of the scheme, and it's not something necessarily that is maybe of utmost importance to this board the host community agreement doesn't come before you it goes before the selectmen they negotiate it but it's part of the big picture right um so i i, I saw what adam said in his side and it was largely correct but i want to i want to clarify it because um what i heard was a little bit different than than what i saw um what i know exists in the regulations and i actually pulled out the exact language here because i wanted to be able to to quote it to you because it's very specific in the statute as to the host community agreement and what it can and can't do a marijuana establishment or a medical marijuana treatment center seeking to operate or continue to operate in a municipality which permits such operation shall execute an agreement with the host community setting forth the conditions to have a marijuana establishment or medical marijuana treatment center located within the host community which shall include, but not be limited to, all stipulations of responsibilities between the host community and the marijuana establishment or medical marijuana treatment center. An agreement between a marijuana establishment or a medical marijuana treatment center and a host community may include a community impact fee for the host community, provided, however, that the community impact fee shall be reasonably related to the costs imposed upon the municipality by the operation of the marijuana establishment or medical marijuana treatment center and shall not amount to more than 3% of the gross sales of the marijuana establishment or medical marijuana treatment center or be effective for longer than five years. So this means a few things as I interpret it. And again, no case law to assist, just the Cannabis Control Commission saying what it thinks it means. This is in the statute, not in the regulations that the CCC adopted. So you need to establish this reasonable relationship between the community impact fee and the actual impacts to the community. I think that that may, be, may, may prove more difficult than you think. And I appreciate the Chief's comments here about the general impacts of the legalization of marijuana in Massachusetts. But that's not what the statute says. It doesn't say the impact of legalizing marijuana in Massachusetts. It doesn't say the impact mm -hmm. of, of the legislation, of the regulations, the impact that might be felt in Lunenburg because of what you've got going on 
in Fitchburg or in other neighboring communities in Lemonster or wherever else. It speaks specifically about this particular marijuana establishment or medical marijuana treatment center. So what are the effects? Now, may, maybe you can draw a connection between the effects if you've got a retail establishment and if you're increase, incurring increased costs for police protection in the, in the vicinity of the facility, or you're finding um, paraphernalia or other trash near the facility that needs to be cleaned up. Well, that, that can be linked directly to that facility. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to identify the community impacts that relate to cultivation-only facilities. These nondescript buildings, 30, 40, 50,000 square feet of canopy in a nondescript building that has a, from what I've heard in various presentations before various municipal boards, have incredibly sophisticated ventilation systems that in many instances you can be standing outside the building and you don't even get a whiff of marijuana. It could be any manufacturing facility, and they're not. There's no sales that are occurring. There might be a few vehicles that come and go on a daily or a weekly basis to pick up product and relocate it offsite, but that could even be occurring indoors. Yeah. What's the community impact from that? I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to establish that, let alone to document it. I didn't read the last sentence in that paragraph, but the last sentence says you've got to also document it, and it becomes a public record. The idea being, they don't go on to say this, but why would it be? Why would you need to document it, and why would it be a public record? Well, not only so the townspeople can see it, but so that it can be made available to any entity like the Cannabis Control Commission or the Attorney General or the DA that might opt to audit the town and determine whether you're in compliance with this particular provision. And if you're not, decrease the amount of the community impact fee. It also says that the fee is limited to a period of five years. Now, I know that there is some guidance out there, not from the Cannabis Control Commission, but from some other entities, other firms even, that have suggested that you can renegotiate these host community agreements in five years. I think that the concept that you could renegotiate an agreement after five years to require a new fee when the legislature itself has said the fee is limited to five years would be contrary to the statute, <laughs> I think. Um, so I think that you have to accept the reality that you're going to get a fee for five years, and then after five years, the fee stops. I think the legislature expected that it, what would take the place of the fee mm -hmm. would be the 3% sales tax, mm -hmm. which is great, I guess, if you're in support of marijuana and recreational marijuana, if you've got a retail facility, because then there are sales. What if you've got a cultivation only facility, or you've got a manufacturing facility that's preparing um, uh, edibles? There are no sales that occur from those facilities. Those facilities are shipping off to other locations, other other medical marijuana dispen true dispensaries or marijuana establishments that qualify as retailers where the sales are occurring. There will be no sales in Lunenburg in those instances. So are you realizing any sales tax revenue? I think the answer is no. Yeah. And my concern with this is in the context of, you know, you look back over some of the decisions we've made as a community in favor of high-density housing or overlay districts and there can be some significant unintended consequences more kids in the school more demand on public safety we already have a public safety well, two departments that are underfunded and now we open the door and bring more use in more traffic mm -hmm. more calls and if there's no revenue to offset that we've taken a step back as a community and we're going to have tighter budgets and mm -hmm. um, less funding especially if you look at this in light of the fact that if the community impact agreement expires in five years you lose that revenue if you don't have even if you do have a retail segment if you allow that well if a neighboring community says well we're not going to opt for the three percent tax where do you think the retail shops are going to locate? They're going to locate next door and avoid the 3% tax. So you could put yourself in a really difficult spot. Um, you know, how many people live on the New Hampshire border and, but, and then the other, to avoid the sales tax, right? Just right. to play right. devil's advocate, they're going to go, we're going to get the social ills of it, even if it's in the next town over. People aren't just going to say, oh, it's not in Lunenburg. I'm not going to go to Fitchburg and get it. So, Well, it, certainly, but it, the revenue stream is still the thing that I'm looking at is, you know, if you need more public safety staffing and you don't have any revenue for it. Yeah. Well, that's going to boil down to the negotiating skills of our board of selectmen, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. Is there any more public comment from the public? 
Uh, Chief, do you have anything else to add? Or else? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, any more comment from the board or? I uh, just had a couple of get into the weeds of this thing a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> uh, there are no permits for mobile concession stands at this time, right? Nothing like that. No licenses, you mean? Yeah, no, I mean no licenses. Not sorry. yet. Okay. Transient uh, marijuana vendors. Yeah, I mean it. Well, yeah, yeah. She, you know, popping up at like Comic Con. You know what I mean? <laughs> no. Like okay. an ice cream truck. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that the you know the licensing scheme, and I, I'm I'm obviously I expressed no opinion pro or con with respect to these facilities. I've helped communities that have prohibited them, and I've helped other communities that have chosen to restrict them. Much the same as with medical marijuana. Um, but I will say that the, the the licensing scheme itself, separate and apart from your choice to permit them or where to permit them, how to zone them, the licensing scheme is extensive. I think Massachusetts the legislature, maybe not so much the question as it passed in 2016, but when it was rewritten in 2017, the legislature recognized that. Um, the shortcomings of states like like Colorado and um, things that needed to be um, worked into the legislation yeah. uh, and, and it's extensive from security to health and sanitation to it, it's it, it's significant um, so no there, there's there's nothing that address addresses the ability to to sell it in that manner uh, and lastly I am a big proponent of I'm trying to create a community garden somewhere in town right, with some people and uh, what would is there anything that would keep somebody from and you know renting a, a plot and just growing weed <laughs> yeah i think there is yes, <laughs> yes they you can only grow it on your own property it has to be on your own property uh it, it does and you need to comply with all the security protocols for example which you okay. couldn't do by just renting a spot in a shared community garden okay um most of this has occurred certainly all of medical incurred occurred um but most of what i've seen in terms of proposals for recreational has been indoor um, you can do outdoor cultivation under the current regulations for recreational marijuana there can be outdoor cultivation um, but generally it's on a much larger scale and there are security protocols you need to have it entirely fenced there's a uh, with a perimeter fence there needs to be uh, security by way of cameras or otherwise so you couldn't do it in a shared setting okay thank you Anything else? Not for think now. Touched on enough for tonight? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we'll be discussing it at length, I'm sure, over the course of the next eight months. Um, so now, yeah, now we'll move into our ad hoc open space committee composition. Yeah, so I received... Um, an email and, and I'd have a, I'd had a conversation with the uh, chair of the ad hoc open space committee recently about their membership um, they're currently in the process of, of updating the town's open space and recreation plan and for I think its entire life it's been a five member committee uh, a member of conservation a member of planning and, and three members at large and uh, They've recognized, I think, over the past two or three months that uh, having a member of the Parks Commission would probably be incredibly useful and appropriate and uh, help make the plan not just about land conservation or uh, preservation, but also about actually meeting the community's needs for recreation and active park space and and how those two things can sort of exist in, in a symbiotic relationship that moves the town to where it needs to be, especially seeing uh, the population growth that we've seen over the last uh, seven or eight years to a decade. Uh, and, you know, six member committees are always kind of a hot mess. So uh, they've asked that the board uh, increase the membership to seven members. Uh, they have an interested citizen at large. Uh, who would, would fill the seventh seat, and they have uh, two members of the Parks Commission who have uh, discussed it, and, and I think that they've come to a conclusion that they would be willing and, and able to put forth a, a candidate to sit on, on the committee to uh, really round out the discussion and, and put forward a, a plan that, that addresses not only conservation and preservation, but active uh, and passive re recreation in a way that um, looks at what we have and, and what would be reasonable going forward. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, I said the member of I'm the member of on the open space committee. 
uh, of the planning board on the open space committee and yeah what, one of the things we realized is that the parks commission could have been if they had been a part of that board um, they could have gotten the money for Wallace Park uh, in the form of a grant so, or some portions of or it, some yes. portions of it yeah so could or save future the, parks future Correct. parks yep so it makes sense to have them on there what action do we need to take uh, since they're a subcommittee of the planning board you'd need to uh, formally vote to change the composition uh, expanding the number and excuse me assi assigning those two seats to a uh, member at large and a, a member of the Parks Commission are we prepared to appoint the people I mean we can take the vote to uh, we do have the member at large and the Parks Commission it would be up to them as, as okay. appointing a, a Parks representative I think it's a good idea. Um, if any, unless somebody has some ob objections, I'd entertain a motion. I move that we uh, approve the change from five to seven members, including one parks commissioner and one citizen at large. Second. Ooh, sorry. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And then and Sarah Kammer yep. okay. uh, has come forth and asked to be appointed as the the open citizen at large. I think she's attended your last two meetings. She attended the last meeting. Um, yeah. She was a member of the Stormwater Task Force. Uh, she's got extensive graphic information system uh, knowledge. She's a PhD in environmental science or some. She's also a teacher. Just, uh, yes. Has this been advertised in any way? Not this. I mean. I, I don't know that it's been advertised. Uh, she did fill out a talent bank form. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's given a fair opportunity to present. And, and I think that that's fine. Them. We can certainly let the town manager know and, and put the information out there. Would um, you rather do that? And you can I'd like to give, not to say she's not unqualified, but I mean, if it hasn't been advertised, it's kind of, you're just, yeah, you sure. never know who else is going to be interested. So, but that's up to, I mean, I'll take input from the board on that. She I will. did meet her. She was very helpful already. She's uh, brought us an application, uh, a mobile app that we can use to uh, go out into the field and do field studies of all of our um, recreational assets. Do you think waiting, hmm? how long would it take to advertise? Their next it? meeting is July 25th. Yeah. So, so we would have time to advertise yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Do you think waiting in any way would, just until our next I meeting? I understand your point and it's a good point. I, 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 I agree with you. Okay. you. You should, you know. I don't want to hold things up. Keep the process up, open. If if, no, but in fairness, keep the, open, the process I, I, open. Is, I may even advocate, um, advertising and pointing on the 23rd which would still be prior to the meeting of the 25th and okay. you know with next week being holiday and getting the ad out there um, it would give you that extra assurance that you've given people all possible opportunity to respond sure any is that okay acceptable to everybody all right that's fine i just think it should be fair that everybody gets an opportunity so yeah so we won't we'll just hold off do we need to take a vote to do that or no or uh no i'll just wing it i mean it's it's a i mean there's a seat on the open space right. okay ad hoc committee all right we already increased the membership there's so there's a vacancy as it's correct sits now, so. yeah all right thank you um minutes approval uh there are the regular minutes aren't prepared as of yet for the June 11th meeting but the two public hearings are so I'd accept the motion on the June 11th 2018 Tritown landing public hearing we need to make a motion and a vote now so oh uh, which one are you doing uh, the Tritown landing I move we approve the minutes from Tritown hearing Dated 6 11 18. Is there a second? Second. Got a question? Sure. So I was not in attendance at the meeting, but I did watch it on uh, YouTube. Does that mean I can approve the minutes or do I have to abstain because you I was have to abstain. Okay. Just okay. double check. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain? Aye. Aye. Next one? <coughs> Yeah. I move we accept the minutes from 1054 Northfield Road dated 6 11 18. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain? Aye. Aye. 
And the final one? Uh, the hours aren't no, done yet. Not prepared we'll yet. have to wait till our next meeting to approve those. Which leads me to another question, if I may. <laughs> By all means. Uh, I, I did watch the uh, the meeting and saw the Tritown uh, discussion, and I saw the Northfield discussion, but I didn't continue through the end of the meeting where the um, committee appointments were made, and I didn't see the minutes. So I was just curious who the new committee members are. You're the new vice chair. No, no. <laughs> no, you, you, you were elected clerk and still. No, I, knew I, I was, knew I was clerk because you did that at the beginning of yep. the meeting. And yeah. I saw the um, But JTCs. you deferred the, the committees to the end of the meeting, and I didn't get to the end of the meeting. All the committees. No. Yeah, you. I think you are still so MJTC. Still MJTC? Okay. Yep. And, yep. Uh, Tanner, Tanner is MRPC. MRPC. Okay, thanks. great. And Michael Ray is <laughs> continuing his charter <laughs> review. All right, good. You're welcome. So. Enjoy. All right, thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, no sorry, problem. I didn't mean to create uh, confusion. Just when you got to mine, I wasn't sure if I was yeah. speaking or not. Oh, no. So we'll go into committee reports. Uh, Green Communities Task Force, nothing to report. Capital planning. Nothing to report. No meeting. Uh, the... Um, AgCom, the uh, first f farmer's market was uh, uh, Sunday, yesterday, and uh, it was a great day. The Thunder Boomers held off. Um, we had eight vendors. Um, we had more sign up, but uh, that was a good turnout. Um, the uh, Agricultural Commission in co uh, with the Lunenburg Community Farmer's Market is looking to sponsor the band concert coming up on either July 16th or July 30th. We were told they were both available, and I have not heard back from Elaine yet. Um, nice. And um, so we are down to three members. So we can't have anybody missing uh, due to quorum because we are supposed to have five. Um, and thereby, our next meeting is going to be the second Thursday of the month rather than the third because someone couldn't make the third. And um, the obvious fact that we need two alternates and two appointed members for AGCOM. Okay. Talent is that, bank? Is that, yeah, that's talent bank. Is, bank. It, is that also advertised? Or um, I, it's appointed by the Board of Selectmen. Oh, okay. So but that would, that's, that's their job. Whether it's advertised or not, I, I couldn't say. I okay. believe they announce the I mean, vacancies they, quite frequently. Yeah. But. And it's appointment season, so <laughs> there's probably a list posted somewhere of vacant positions. All right. Is that it? That's it. MJDC, MJDC uh, meeting for June was canceled. Open uh, space. Open space. Our meeting uh, was long and successful, and we got a lot of work done. Um, Can you, I forgot my phone. Like I said, uh, Sarah brought in that uh, mobile app, and we divvied up about, I don't know, maybe 10 properties that we're going to go out and test it on. Uh, and hopefully, my hope is that eventually that will be part of some kind of a uh, stewardship program in town where you can be in charge of you know uh, some plot of land and uh, give uh, live feedback to the conservation commission on the, the assets that we have out there you know if there's a problem like I don't know if you watched uh, or saw on Facebook recently somebody in the Mulpus Brook area spotted a piece of wood that was missing from one of the bridges that kind of information can go right back to Conscom. They can make a decision about, you know, how they're going to take care of that situation, or they can reach out to uh, the community at large and just say, anybody, you know, in the group, one of the stewards, head on out there and fix it right away. Mm -hmm. Good. So we're making progress on. Uh, You've been meeting more frequently, anyway, so that's <laughs> always a plus. <laughs> once, a once a month, then we get it done. Well, I think we went up for a string of about eight or nine months. We didn't have a meeting at one point, so. <laughs> Uh, MRPC, we meet the 28th. Isn't that Tanner? No, uh, <laughs> oh. actually, no, it doesn't take, his, his, new, his new role does not take effect until, oh, right. until July. Sorry. Uh, oh. Charter review. <laughs> uh, so Michael Ray Jeffrey sent a, an email. The Charter Review Committee has resumed meeting. Uh, they met on June 11th, and we'll meet again on Wednesday, June 27th. Um, they have new school committee appointees, and they are looking to reorganize members, uh, reassign tasks and responsibilities, uh, and they're looking at evaluating the changes and breaking them down into different categories, typographical and legal corrections, substantive and non-controversial, 
uh, and substantive and controversial. I guess that. Uh, and the committee is hoping to present um, articles to town meeting. Uh, it doesn't say which town meeting, but I would expect, oh, it does say. Uh, they're looking to present to annual town meeting in 2019, which would be the first Saturday in May of 2019. Uh, check them out on YouTube. Go to the meetings. Uh, I'm sure they'll have another public hearing. Uh, it also says that they reviewed uh, comments and feedback from the public hearing that was held this past April at their first meeting on the 11th. All right, thank you. Uh, director's items. Mm. I think we. My my whole items were spent on marijuana. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, notices and communications. I think we've all received them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, meeting schedule. Our next meeting is July 9th and 23rd. Do we have anything? Uh, not at this yet? time. I think we'll have a scenic road hearing on the 23rd. Um, and at the, this time, that's all I've I've heard coming forward. Okay. Um, do we want to skip or just go to the ongoing items quickly before we go into executive session, so we don't have to get them back into regular session after yeah. the meeting? Um, so, Village of Flat Hill, any update on that? No, I have not heard uh, back from them. Um, they're still, you know, a week or two weeks away from, from the 30-day okay. uh, timeline. Uh, again, that's a fairly big thing. I've been reviewing the file uh, to see what was done previously. <clears throat> uh, and without really nailing into the, the details of you know, what the engineer said versus what was proposed, uh, it seems like the, at this point, um, the planning board certainly followed a procedure um, it doesn't look like they you know missed um, moving the process uh, whether or not the contents of that process no. were uh, so where does that go from here though they've already you've already sent a letter to the correct the I mean but they well they've they yeah. when does their 30 days run out to respond? Uh, they they picked it up on June 7th okay. so I would say sometime you know, I'd have to count it out but around July 7th All right. And we haven't heard anything yet? No. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, are, are they doing anything about the road? Um, they, they repaved the road, and it's all already falling apart. Well, That's it's not a... That water it wasn't going. a repavement. Oh, well, okay, I, I know. They're not going to finish if, if until this at, problem is... So, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was saying, if you look at all the areas in town where we've resurfaced, mm -hmm. they are all holding up pretty well. Correct. Except on Flat Hill, where mm -hmm. all that water is draining along the side of the road. It's all broken apart already. Mm -hmm. So are they fixing that as part of this? They're not going to do anything. Jack Rodican spoke at the Board of Selectmen. He said it's going to sit as it is until we figure the water issue out, and okay. then they'll all right, fix the road because there's okay. no sense in fixing yeah, the road. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's ridiculous thing. to put a second layer of payment on that. Correct. And, and, that, and, and, uh, yeah. and I think what you see is uh, out here on Lancaster is a good example. They did a leveling course to fill the holes and cracks and all of that, and then they top-coated it. Uh, and what's out there on Flat Hill is just the leveling course um, to make it uh, more drivable. Uh, and he, he, as as the chair said, he he did say he wouldn't be doing any further work until that was completed. And I think that even any patches to that is sort of subject to where this drainage investigation uh, and whatnot go as to how that all gets resolved okay thanks mm -hmm. board of appeals um, again that's just the the bylaw and you know the board has talked about either extending it or extending the timeline um, trying to to re-approach town meeting with the same bylaw uh, eliminating it We've talked about it. I don't know if there was ever any real any real right. decision on what the board ch wished to do. And then economic development. They this, had a meeting recently. We had a meeting this morning with the business town partnership, uh, and the president and two members of the board of the Pepperell Business Association were there and provided. Uh, 
think, helpful guidance to uh, the business members that were there of the potential Lunenburg Business Association uh, and really focused on how the business association is its own non-municipal entity and uh, is a is a partner with the municipality and, and cooperates and coordinates but uh, really functions in its own way and and does things to uh, collaborate with its members and itself uh, with the community as a whole and really looks to create an identity and and exposure for for its business members all right thank you i don't want to get into it now because it's not on the agenda but can we put asian imperial back on yeah. the agenda i actually had a question about well i'll wait for a comment i'm sorry um is there any more public comment from the board yeah <laughs> Um, what is our recourse with respect to Asian Imperial and that uh, three or four spaces on electric that are not supposed to be there? Uh, it's it's a it's a zoning enforcement. Okay. We would probably make a recommendation that he send a letter. I'm sure have it built to as built, but okay. We can discuss it when it's on the agenda. Is there any more public comment from the public? No. All right. Uh, any board comments or concerns? Alrighty, then uh, oh, we're going to go into executive session pursuant to General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, namely Town of Lunenburg versus Settler Solar at L, Worcester Superior Court Docket Number 1785CV01959 D, and Settler Solar LLC at L. First Town of Lunenburg at all. Land Court Docket Number 17, MISC 000690, HPS, where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the town. I'd take a motion to enter into that and not to re enter into regular session. So moved. Second. 